just to say, Nikki, there's a reason you can't hear the audio because we haven't started yet. So hopefully you can hear. Okay, good morning, Borada, to our colleagues from Wales. Um, welcome to uh, day three of the QNI's fourth annual online conference. My name is Professor John Unsworth, and I have the great honour of being the Chair of Council of the Queen's Nursing Institute, and I'm going to take us through today's proceedings as the Chair. Right from the outset, I'd like to extend my sincere thanks to our sponsors, Teva, Hallam Medical, and to the National Garden Scheme. We would like to encourage you to visit the virtual brew booths during the break, uh, where you can download resources from each of the sponsors. And um, that will also be available alongside the VFAS platform for up to a month after the conference closes. A massive thank you to the Queen's Nurse Institute staff, particularly to Edina Pito, the events manager, to Aga Kushmesh, the Senior Programme and Events Coordinator, and other members of Adina's team, including Louise Bellamy and Gabriella Ayson. And of course, to our amazing comms team, uh, Matthew Bradbury, Joanna Sagnella, and Hannah Mountford. Um, as uh, Crystal has said on other days, uh, the entire team at the Cuban's Nurse Institute are, an entire, are a joy to work with and are so creative and so supportive throughout all of our events. So the whole team pulls together to deliver our events. So the entire team uh, have been involved in planning this week and uh, many of them are here today and for the rest of the week, both delivering sessions and supporting us through um, monitoring the um, chat panel and the questions and answers. And so you may not see them on screen, but they're the invisible workforce, as is many uh, of our colleagues in community nursing, and they ensure that we're able to deliver such a fantastic event. 
The event is free to attendees, so please do think about donating to the Q&I as we go through the day and through the rest of the week. Um, and then this will allow us to continue to organise these events and to keep them free um, to all participants. Um, so this is an aspect that we'd like to think of as paying forward so we can do this again next year. Donations, no matter how small, um, even if it's just the cost of what you would have spent on a cup of coffee traveling to a face-to-face -to -face event, then um, please do uh, think about um, making that donation to the QNI because they do help support us as a charity and they enable us to continue our fantastic work, which you'll hear about this morning from our chief executive, as well as supporting nurses across health and social care. People who are unfamiliar with the Queen's Nurse Institute uh, may be interested to know that our work includes standard setting and supporting nurses in a number of ways through both CPD opportunities like this conference and through our leadership programmes and supporting quality improvement in practice through our innovation uh, projects. You'll hear more about that um, this morning, as well as our fabulous Queen's Nurses Network from our chief executive in the first session. So let's look at the aims and purpose of the conference this week. The theme of this year's conference is In the Spotlight, Nurses Leading Care in People's Homes and Communities. And the week, um, oh, this is day three, um, has uh, offered us a, a range of exciting and uplifting speakers to help us um, go back to our workplaces feeling energised and connected. So the theme today is population health and sustainability. So just before we move to our first speaker of the day, let's look at some housekeeping aspects. This is our second event using VFAIRS, and we hope that you enjoy using it and explore the different features, including exhibitor booths and networking facilities. If you leave the main session, you will go back to the lobby area, which will allow you to explore different features and places on the platform. There's also an info desk, which you can click on, uh, while we're live, if you have any queries and send those through to the team. As attendees, you will be on mute throughout the session and your cameras will be turned off. There is a chat facility um, and if you wish to use it, um, then please do check that you are sending your messages to everyone rather than just to the hosts and panellists, unless, of course, you wish to contact just the hosts and panellists. Importantly, there is also a question and answers feature. Um, as people will know, particularly at the start of the sessions, the chat box moves very quickly. So it's difficult for the team to identify questions. So if you do have a question for any of the presenters, then please do put it in the Q and A section of, of um, the platform rather than in the, the chat panel. That will help us get your question to the presenters. There's also a live captions option, um, which you can switch on to enable you to see the live text. Um, the icon is in the tray at the bottom of your screen, um, and you can click to turn it on and off. If you go to the top of your screen, you should have a little button marked view. Um, you'll be able to um, select how you see the speakers and their presentation, either side by side, or um, you can have the gallery view or the speaker view. We are very active on social media and many colleagues have been, so please help us um, hopefully try to um, show people what they're missing and to share um, details of the, the sessions via um, social media. Um, I refuse to call it X, so I'm going to call it Twitter. And the hashtag is uh, hashtag QNI 2023. We will be recording some of the main uh, sessions over the four day period. And there is a, the opportunity to see some of these sessions if you've missed any of them and they'll be available on the vfairs platform for up to one month after the conference if you have any colleagues um, who've missed the event and you think it will be worthwhile them looking at the sessions then they can register after the event and then uh, view the recorded sessions within the platform so, um, without further ado, we're going to move to our first speaker of the day. 
and um, during various technical problems, we've had quite a few questions about um, the work of the QNI. So this will be a fantastic opportunity for my uh, fantastic colleague uh, and the QNI's chief executive, Dr. Crystal Oldman, to outline the work of the Queen's Nursing Institute in improving nursing care in our communities. So Crystal's going to present for a short while, and then there'll be an opportunity to uh, ask any questions. Just as a reminder, please do put your questions in the Q and A tab in the bottom rather than in the chat panel. Um, and so we can identify your question. Over to Crystal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Um, a joy to be here and to see everybody. Thank you for that introduction. So and yes, we've had a lot of questions about the work of the Q&I. So I'm going to do a quick run through. Um, I couldn't possibly share everything that we do because it would take way more than the 30 minutes or so that I've got just now and I really do want to leave time for questions so hurry me up John if I'm not going fast enough um so um, and Adina thank you for controlling the slides if you could go to our next slide on here you can see our strategic plan and I've got colleagues as, as John said the invisible Q&I workforce that are behind all of this um our going to put some links into the into the chat box so that you can go directly to anything that I'm putting up here. We'll, we'll send a direct link onto our website from our website. So um, the work of the Q&I, we have a strategic plan. We used to have a strategic plan on 16 pages. And John, as our chair of council, was really clear when we were developing this, actually in the first wave of the pandemic in 2020, that we needed to have a strategic plan that was readable and that colleagues like yourselves on this call today um, can see and read very easily. I don't think anyone read our 16 page strategic plan before this. So I'm gonna focus on those six goals that we have and show you what we do under each of those. And they're divided into influence, into quality and into voice. So on our next slide, you heard from Professor Alison Leary just yesterday. Um, who was talking about her work that she works, she works with us part time um, and she heads up our International Community Nursing Observatory. And many of you would have heard me say before, never try to influence policy without the data, the evidence, the intelligence to support your proposition in influencing policy. And so Alison works with us. You would have heard some of the work that she is undertaking with us. And I'm going to share a little bit more. Uh, today. On the next slide, you can see uh, that we had, our, we had Alison as our inaugural uh, speaker giving the William Rathbone the 10th annual lecture and award that took place in June this year. And in the centre there, you can see Bill, William Rathbone, Bill Rathbone, who was a trustee with us for 48 years. Yes, you heard that right. 48 years, and he is the great, great grandson of our founder. And you can see here um, Alison's lecture, Link Thinking Differently About Nursing Workforce Challenges. Now, one of my colleagues will put the link to that recording of that annual lecture. And it, when it, at the time when we recorded it and we put it up on social media, it absolutely went viral. Please help us do the same again. Um, Alison speaks brilliantly about the challenges that we have in the nursing workforce, that we all have in the nursing workforce, and how to think differently about that, those challenges. You can also see here that as part of our, as a part of this um, it, first innovation in having the William Rathbone annual lecture, we have created in Bill Rathbone's name an award for the most outstanding executive nurse leader of a community provider organisation. And you can see here our first winner is Michelle Bateman, who's the chief nurse in Derbyshire. I expect many of you know her. Um, and uh, I, there is an official photograph on the right hand side. You can see um, a picture of Michelle uh, with one of our Queen's nurses, Zena Edmonds Charles, Charles who uh, retired from general practice aged 83. And it was such a joy to have Azina here uh, on, that, uh, in, on that lecture. And then a joy to, for 
uh, Michelle and Zena to meet and compare notes about their careers. And this is just a wonderful uh, moment when they were laughing so much together about their experiences in nursing. So I didn't put up the official one. Um, so please do go have a look at that lecture. It is uh, absolutely uh, amazing when you listen to what Alison's got to say. And what she's, what she's trying to uh, propose is that more of our policy creators need to understand and think differently about the nursing workforce. So please share widely. On our next slide, um, one of the things that we do in sharing our intelligence uh, with the policymakers is to describe what nurses do. And if this is about work as done rather than work as imagined. And we were delighted to be commissioned to put together this infographic, which describes the different ways in which nurses touch people's lives from preconception through to end of life. And it's absolutely incredible. And you start to look at that detail, you know it, you know how you touch people's lives. But this has, again is, is a, a piece of work that we're thrilled has gone uh, countrywide, uh, UK wide. And we've had a number of nurses who've said that they printed it out, they've laminated it, and they've put it up in waiting rooms and GP practices, for example, to show what nurses are doing across that lifespan. So a bit of a work um, that we've been doing on our next slide, you can see this is the sort of work that we've been doing in terms of our data and evidence. Now, Alison spoke about this yesterday, so I won't go into any detail, but it's really important that we give you a voice if you've got challenges with digital innovations, if you've got challenges in your workplace and you're a single voice, what we're able to do through the ICNO, through the work that Alison leads is to bring those voices together, to bring that data and evidence together and to share this with the policymakers. It's been very, very effective. And again, my colleagues will put a link uh, to that report into the chat box. And on the next slide, another piece of work that we do have been doing every year is our district nurse education audit. And the reason that we started doing this is because we were seeing around nine years ago, we were seeing a decline in the commissions for district nurse education for the specialist practice qualification. And so every year we committed to collecting the data around the UK, around the number of district nurses that were being educated every year so that we could showcase what the challenges were. Um, and again, my colleagues will put the, the link into the chat box and you can see we, there has been a recent decline in the numbers and you can see the numbers up on the screen there, a decrease of 6% and then another decrease of 9%. We are really anticipating, hoping, given the whole direction of travel to more care in the community, we are anticipating with our support, your support, that there will be an increase in the commissions going forward and the funding. And we do know that in England, there's a piece of work going on at the moment that is led within NHS England by the Workforce Training Education Directorate, looking at the procurement process for the district nurse and other SPQ programs, and also the equity in the backfill. So if you don't know about that piece of work, do ask your regional office and do get involved with that. Because again, it's your intelligence, your data that will count. Thank you. And on the next slide, so I've talked about influence, policy influence and development, and a bit about our data and evidence, lots more on the website. Moving on to quality, innovation and quality improvement. So on the next slide, um, a little bit about our innovation. So led by uh, Dr. Amanda Young, who's with us today. And if you have questions around innovation, and the innovation work that we do, please do put those questions in the chat box, uh, sorry, in the Q&A for Amanda, and she'll be able to answer them. Um, our innovation programme, we have, and we've been delighted to be supported by the National Garden Scheme with our LC WAG scholarships. So these are open right now. We'll put the link in the chat box so that you can find out a little bit more about these totally focused on gardens and health. So these are nurse-led projects where the National Garden Scheme is supporting us to support you with an innovation that you have 
that's related to health, gardens and gardening to improve people's physical, mental, emotional health. We have had some amazing projects that we've supported over the last couple of years. And I've personally been to see some of them and they are stunning. You do not have to be a Queen's nurse to undertake an Elsie Wag scholarship. These are open to all. So please do go and have a look. There's an opportunity to apply now. And we provide a wraparound support program. All of that is totally funded. Your travel is funded for that. And up to £5,000 for the funding that you need to deliver that project, for the things that you need to buy to deliver that project. And some stunning, stunning projects have been created and delivered and are completely sustainable. Goes really well with the theme that we have today of sustainability. And right the way across uh, primary care, social care, and NHS and wider healthcare services. Um, so thank you for that. And the next, there's some examples. I think we've got some pictures on there of some of the projects that we uh, have been supporting. And, and then a picture of Amanda in the middle and on the uh, bottom right hand side, they're visiting some of the projects and supporting them. So please do get in touch with Amanda if you'd like to find out more and explore the website where we've got that information. Um, on the next slide, another opportunity, this is open right now as well. If you have an idea for improving diabetes care, care of people that have diabetes that are in your uh, community, please do get in touch. Again, the link is gonna be put in the website. I know my team are really busy in the background putting all these in, into the chat box so that you can see what that opportunity is. We are very grateful to the Burdett Trust for Nursing for supporting seven places. So that's seven places that we will be able to support going on to our, our innovation program with, with, with projects that are focused specifically on improving the care for people with diabetes. And we know that nurses are leading um, and leading cutting edge work, nursing work with people who have diabetes. So please do have a look at that and uh, any queries. Amanda, I did say I'd name check you several times. Any queries, please contact Amanda. And on our next slide, in terms of a wider opportunities for innovation projects, we know that every nurse, every one of you who's on the call today will have a great idea for improving care. We know that if only you had the wraparound support, if only you had a little bit of money to help you do it, you would be able to deliver on that project and you'd be able to create uh, better health, better well-being for the people that you care for, because you've got a great idea for how to change things in practice. Is it sustainable? Is it something that's scalable? Is it something that will last after the project? If it is, talk to your employer and see if they will support you to come on to an open program. And again, more information is, is available and we'll put the link on the website, there, on, the, on the chat box there. Thank you. So onto, that's our innovation and our quality improvement. And uh, onto our next slide, you'll see something about our standards. So we're doing a lot of work on standards. And earlier this year, in January this year, we published our Q&I standards for practice teachers. Um, excuse me. <laughs> our Q&I standards, this was led by Angie Hack. Angie is here with us today. So if you have any questions about our practice teaching standards, please do contact Angie. I'm sure Angie's going to put her details into the chat box. We were really interested to hear that the NMC are maybe thinking about having lost the regulation of the practice teaching qualification. And, and the reason that we created these standards is because we heard from employers um, that there was some challenges with not having access to a practice teacher program. Uh, that, and they asked us, would we please create national standards for practice teaching, at which we've done. And we know that there's a possibility that this might be re reviewed, viewed again uh, by the NMC. And we also know, which is really uh, refreshing, uh, that a lot of universities never stopped their practice teaching programs. So that's really, really good and shows the kind of demand for it. 
So that's one example of our published standards. And then a lot of work has been taking place over the last 18 months. Um, on our next slide, you can see our field specific standards for advanced practice in community nursing. So building on the SPQ standards um, for specialist practice in community nursing uh, that were published last summer by the NMC, we have created, again, popular demand um, field specific because, as you'll know, the NMC standards are core standards. Uh, they are, there is nothing specific to the field of practice that you're preparing to become a team leader of within those standards. Nothing specific to your field of practice. So we were asked um, again by our um, networks, um, by our the employers of all of these uh, nurses working in the fields of practice like yourselves, we were asked to create field specific standards. And I'm absolutely delighted that our trustees uh, went on to support that proposition and that proposal that we should do this. So we spent a lot of time doing this over the last 18 months. This work is led by Dr. Agnes Fanning, who is also here in the background. If you have any questions about the, the standards and fields of practice, as standards that we are creating and have created, please uh, do go to, along to her session. There's a, a round table later. I should have said that as well for uh, Amanda Young. Um, we also have a round table with Amanda on the innovation projects. So these are built around the four pillars of advanced practice and clearly reflect the advanced level of practice at which you are working in each of those fields of practice as a leader of the team in those nursing services. So please do go, we, again, there'll be a link in the chat box, please do go and have a look at those. And we are absolutely thrilled to have been able to articulate what advanced practice looks like in, in all of those fields of practice. Many of them are new, um, as in they haven't been name checked by the NMC historically, and, and actually in those, uh, those standards that were published last year. So homeless and inclusion, nursing, adult social care nursing, community palliative and end of life care nursing, and health and justice nursing are all new. Um, and those were the, the three at the bottom without the icons are being, uh, we're about to be consulted on publicly. You'll have an opportunity to feed back to us on those. All of the others with the icons are all published and on the website. No, I'm, I, my apologies, they're not on the website, but, uh, but information about them is on the website. Universities are now contacting us um, and are being, we are sharing those standards with the universities uh, so that we could then have an endorsement process with them. So the universities will be creating the SBQ programs that are approved by the NMC and using our standards to demonstrate and reflect advanced practice. And then we they will apply to us to, to have an endorsement by the QNI. So the, the, whilst you won't be able to see those standards from, on our website, you'll be able to work with your local university to be able to uh, feed into the development, the co-development and co-production of those standards. Thank you for that. And please do, if you want to know more, please do contact Agnes and do uh, go along to her round table later on this afternoon. On the next slide, again, very much related to advanced practice, the QNI became a member of the International Council of Nurses um, a couple of years ago, actually almost two years ago to the day. And we are delighted that we've now got international links and that which are incredibly helpful around looking at advanced practice and what's happening in all of the other countries. Um, we well, are de also delighted that John and myself were able to attend the ICN um, conference and meeting of the National Networks Nursing Associations in Montreal in the summer. And we went along to a session around advanced practice and we are planning to share our work on those standards for advanced practice and community nursing. There was a huge amount of interest in those standards when we went along to that session. And uh, we plan to share 
our work with the ICN more formally at the conference that's taking place in Scotland um, in the summer next year. So more on that and more around our work and how we're sharing that internationally and learning from what other nurses are doing internationally. Using the four pillars of advanced practice has been uh, the best thing that we could have done, I think, uh, because that's so well recognized internationally. I think I'm being moved on. <laughs> My slide has moved on. And lastly, talking, that's fine, please do go on. Um, the, on the next slide, um, yeah, so talking about our um, voice, our role models and our leaders. So on the next slide, you can see all of our networks. We have 10 networks and uh, there's, there's something there for everybody. I think you can see if you were looking at, um, uh, if you saw Ben, uh, ben Bowers, who works with us, who leads our Community Nursing Research Forum, and he shared uh, the work of the forum on Monday. And following that, his presentation, we immediately had 60 more people who signed up, making a, a network of more than 700 nurses interested in research. So have a look at all of those networks. Again, my colleagues will put links into the, the chat box right now. And uh, and a massive thank you to Hallam, who have been supporting our CNEN, our Community Nurse Exec Network, and our ICB Chief Nurse Network. So a massive thank you to those, uh, for those, for the support of those, and, and also to the National Garden Scheme for their support of the Queen's Nurse Network and the work that we do there has been um, absolutely incredible. We've, we're grateful too for, to the um, RCN Foundation for supporting our Care Home Nurse Network for the last uh, four years. Uh, we've had support for that. And to the Department of Health and Social Care for our ICP Champions Network. Um, and NHS England have until recently supported our long COVID uh, nurse group uh, that's um, and full of nurses from a whole variety of different fields of practice. So thrilled with that. And we will be continuing all of these um, all of these networks so please do engage with those join them um, where you can and where it's relevant to your field of practice on our next slide and I'm going to hurry up a bit now because I know we need to have some time for questions um, and just a shout out really for how we influence policy through our Queen's nurses uh, all Queen's nurses here you are amazing we use the hashtag extraordinary Queen's nurses or extraordinary QN um, on uh, Twitter, and uh, what we what we do is to call on uh, policymakers to come and shadow uh, a Queen's nurse for the day, for a half day, into a clinic, into home visits, into a GP practice, and we've really found that in all of those areas that you can see of nursing there, we've really found that having a, a, a policymaker, sometimes these are very senior MPs, uh, sometimes they're very senior civil servants coming out and shadowing a Queen's nurse in their day to day work, literally going into people's houses. We don't make a, we don't do any publicity around this. But in the background, this is what we're doing. It really, really makes a difference. Work at seeing work as done and all the challenges rather than work as imagined. Really important. Um, and on to the next slide in our leadership programs. So, again, we we have. We are supporting role models and, and leaders through our programs. We have an aspiring leaders program, an executive leadership program, and we also take commissions for bespoke CPD and leadership programs. Um, and Dr. Kate Wood is here today. Dr. Kate Wood is leading all of our leadership portfolio. And I know that she's also running a round table and be really pleased uh, to have you ask questions and come to her round table about our leadership programs. More than 50% of those nurses who are taking our, have taken our aspiring or our exec programs by the end of the program have already gone on to a more senior, or a more responsible role by the end of the programme. We know that these are really, really effective. So do get engaged and uh, do have a look at our programmes. On our next slide, the other way that we get involved with, with our Queen's nurses and others in our networks is to, for them to support us developing resources. So here's some of our Queen's nurses who supported us to develop our resources on 
um, student for student nurses. So again, um, in, it'll be in the chat box. I, I really hope my team are keeping up with this. I'm so sorry. I didn't don't think I told you quite how many times I was going to be asking you to put links in the chat box. Um, so thank you to all of our, our QNs and others in our networks who are supporting us through this, this sort, these sort of resources. And on the next slide, films. We, we really think that films are very, very effective. Again, showing work as done rather than work as imagined. And, and this is just a sample of the sorts of films that we have on our website. I'm not going to ask my team to put every link up. Do go and explore. We have uh, some fantastic uh, films that are real nurses doing the real job in people's homes and communities. And again, a, a massive thanks to Hallam on the top left-hand side, you can see an animation that was created. Um, it was actually created for the year of the nurse and the midwife, but it's still absolutely relevant today. Please do have a look at that. That's a, a, a brilliant animation and a support for demonstrating the breadth and scope of the, and the impact that nurses have in the community. And almost finally, our support for nurses function on the next slide, you'll see that um, we have three services that we offer. We offer a talk to us service, which is for nurses who are completely anonymous, for nurses who would like to have a listening call with one of our trained listeners, nurses who may be having uh, some difficulty, uh, emotional difficulty. We started this during the pandemic and we've continued it on. It is not a counselling service, it is a listening service, and we know that nurses have really benefited from it. Uh, we don't collect data, we don't know who calls us, because this is completely anonymous, and it means that nurses can talk to somebody outside of their family, they can talk to somebody outside of their, the, the team that they're working with or outside of their employment. So that's been incredibly successful. And again, our thanks to RCN Foundation for supporting us with that. In the middle, you can see we also have financial help for nurses in financial difficulty through no fault of their own. And our Keep in Touch project, which is supporting around 50 older, retired and isolated nurses to keep in touch with nurses who are currently in the workforce. And they're all of our volunteers are Queen's nurses keeping in touch every week um, by telephone with, uh, with a retired Queen's nurse. And that's been incredibly, incredibly motivating and moving to hear some of the stories uh, and the relationships that develop uh, through a telephone befriending service. So um, I'm going to finish now with our mantra on the next slide. Be at the table or you'll be on the menu. I really hope that you can see that's just a snapshot of what we're doing. We we are at the table, the fantastic nursing team that we have uh, within our fantastic wider Q&I team are so often at the table and we are speaking, we are being the voice, we are listening to what you're telling us and we are influencing policy. Oh, I had a sneaky suspicion it was all going really well. <laughs> we seem to have lost Crystal. Um, <laughs> so um, where Crystal had almost finished. Um, I, I don't know whether you're still there, Crystal. Um, but, but if not, we're going to move to questions and answers. And it looks as if I'm in the spotlight for this one, Agnes. Um, so if, can we go to the first question until Crystal comes back in? Okay, well, well, the first question was, um, how can we ensure that universities develop courses using the advanced field standards? Okay, um, so there, there has been quite a considerable interest from university in the field specific standards. Um, so and um, there does appear to be a growth in courses which have traditionally not been offered in every region in, in, um, in both um England and in and in Wales so particularly around the growth in areas like community children's nurse for example and there is some interest in the um, new and emerging fields um, homeless and inclusion health and um, the uh, custody and prison health care kind of field specific standards 
the Q and I are currently working on an accreditation program um, for, for for universities where we would approve and provide um, digital resources to uh, courses which um, are approved by us to our standards. Um, the standards work, which has been led by yourself, Agnes, um, and and uh, with the uh, colleagues from the nursing team at the QNI, contributing extensively to the standards reference groups, includes um, other charities uh, like Pathway, for example, in relation to homeless inclusion help uh, health, and um, Marie Curie and um, help the hospices, etc. And we also have a, a UK wide advisory board which also includes our sister organisation, the Queen's Nurse Institute in Scotland. So we're, we're very hopeful that um, universities will um, adopt the field specific standards and will increase the level of provision that's available. Um, I do think that there is a need for people to start looking differently at blended learning and uh, potentially distance learning as well, particularly for some of the fields. And we have discussed that in the, um, the standards board. Um, so hopefully that provides an answer to the question. We, we we can't guarantee everybody will use the standards, but we're very hopeful that they will. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, another question that actually rolls on from that. In terms of interest in the standards, do you think that we're going to see a growth in the these courses across the universities? Yeah, uh, hopefully we'll see a growth. Um, the, um, for example, uh, there's uh, adult social care um, uh, uh, specialist practitioner program. And um, there are a number of regions across the country um, almost shadowing um, what uh, Professor Deborah Sturdy, who's the chief nurse for social care, has set up in relation to those um, social care councils. Um, so my my own university, which had traditionally offered um, specialist community public health programs in school nursing and health visiting and district nursing, is currently looking at community children's nursing, is also looking at general practice nursing and adult social care nursing. And I think you see a similar growth across the country. It has been helped greatly by um, one of our colleagues and um, one of our fellows, um, who has headed up the apprenticeship um, group. So the apprenticeship has moved from being a district nursing apprenticeship to being a community specialist practitioner apprenticeship. And um, that means that organisations will be able to draw down the levy um, from, from um, HMRC in order to fund places on the course. And that will include general practices, et cetera. And um, there is a question about backfill. And, um, and I think this is why we need to um, look at whether we can have blended kind of delivery um, and we continue a dialogue with, um, with the various organisations which head up education and training in, in the, um, the three countries that we cover, so Northern Ireland, in Wales and in England, to, to look at what, what's possible in relation to backfill. Thank you, John. Um, a question now about policy. Can you give us a specific example of how the QNI has actually influenced policy? Okay, um, I, I think it's it, it it's always quite difficult to um, to to guarantee what you did and what you said has directly influenced policy, um, but. Crystal outlined about the shadowing program um, where we use Queen's nurses um, from a variety of different disciplines. And um, one of the people, although we don't make a big publicity and fanfare about this, one of the people who has been out extensively with, with Queen's nurses for shadowing experience is the Shadow Secretary of State for Health, Wes Streeting MP. And um, that work directly helped influence the Labour government's manifest, what will become a manifesto commitment to increase the number of um, people entering training from a variety of different community specialisms. So, so Wes, as far as I'm aware, has been out with the district nurse and has also been out with the community mental health team. Um, just for balance, we've also had specialist advisors um, hello, Crystal. Welcome back. We've also had specialist advisors um, fr from, from the current government, from the Secretary of State's office, who have also been out on shadowing experiences. So, so I, I'd like to think that the uh, long term um, workforce plan in England has been influenced by 
by both that shadowing experience and the other work we've done looking at um, the, the workforce through the International Community Nursing Observatory. And thankfully, I'm out the spotlight now, Agnes. So over to you for a question from Crystal. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Um, Crystal, I've got one more question about the standards here. Um, can people who have an SPQ really be regarded as practising at an advanced level if Centre for Advancing Practice isn't an accredited course? Um, so if, if it's, so this is England, Centre for Advancing Practice, um, and uh, if it's not accredited by, uh, uh, so yes, uh, uh, the I think the what you the question is is the Centre for Advancing Practice the Practice. only way to demonstrate that you if it's an accredited course is that the only way to demonstrate that you are working at an advanced practice level and the answer is no there are other ways. Thank you, thank you, and clearly demonstrated by our standards which are reflecting the four pillars of advanced practice and uh, that uh, that you and the team and so many others have contributed to it's uh, and you've we've created a fantastic um, definition of advanced practice in in the community so thank you for that yeah thank you just to add to that there um that there is one question which are, has been responded to but other people may want to know about it and it's whether health and justice nursing is included within the um forensic nursing um standards and the answer is yes to that so everybody can hear that response yeah the great the the other question which i think had come up in the chat panel and certainly been in um uh, over the past couple of days was around um uh, educational preparation for nurses who are involved in funded nursing care and continuing healthcare assessments and um, I, I think agnes that that's actually included in the adult social care um specialist practitioner qualification isn't it i'm sorry sorry john Sorry, I'm just wrong footing you. It's become a become a no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, there the, there was a question uh, about the um training for nurses who are involved in continuing healthcare assessments yes. mm -hmm. and obviously funded nursing care. A lot of those nurses sit not not exclusively, but a lot of them sit w w w um in in social care. And, and so does the social care SPQ include those nurses? Thank you. Yes, I would probably say they would because continuing care is, is um, practised in the adult social care environment as it is with, with possibly district nursing as well. But certainly adult social care will cover continuing care. Thanks for that. Okay, and um, thank you very much, Agnes and to Crystal for that fantastic session. Um, so you, you missed out on all the questions. I, I didn't say anything inappropriate, which is unusual. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So, I'm so sorry. My entire broadband has gone down, so I've now joined via my phone line. So who'd have thought that that would happen? I think it happened last year. Uh, it doesn't happen very often at home, but it had to happen at that moment. So thank you so much, John, for uh, stepping in and answering those questions. Brilliant. No, no, no problem at all. OK, so we're going to move to our next speakers who are going to talk about managing health inequalities. And I'm delighted um, that we are being joined by Fatima Khan Shah, who is an associate director and for long-term conditions and personalization in the NHS West Yorkshire Integrated Care Board, and by a, a familiar face to people who've been to our conferences previously, who is Rob Webster, who um, is uh, also a QI fellow, um, who's the chief executive of the South West Yorkshire Partnership NHS Foundation Trust, and chief executive designate of the West Yorkshire and Harrogate Integrated Care System. Um, and so welcome Fatima and Rob, and I think um, that you don't have any slides, so we shall take down the slide just with the introduction and we'll hand over to, to both of you. Thank you very much. Which is really dangerous, John, to be fair. I mean, giving me control of the reins with Rob. Um, not, some no. people would ring alarm bells, but we'll, we'll do our best. I'll certainly do my best uh, to be on my best behaviour. Um, Rob, your job title's changed a bit. Um, 
since the last one. Do you want to, do you want to introduce yourself with your sort of current role? Yeah, sure. So uh, thanks, everybody. So uh, since we've become a statutory body, uh, I don't run the South West Yorkshire Partnership NHS Foundation Trust anymore. That's now Mark Brooks, who's doing a brilliant job there. And uh, I'm Chief Executive of uh, NHS West Yorkshire Integrated Care Board uh, and the Lead Chief Exec for the Integrated Care System. So uh, that's fine. We're so lucky to have you, though, which is why I was like, no, no, hang on, we're not sharing him with anyone anymore. He's all ours now. Um, and I've obviously changed jobs as well, haven't I, Rob? I've become the first ever West Yorkshire Inclusivity Champion, um, which is a role that has been absolutely championed by the West Yorkshire Health and Care Partnership and the West Yorkshire Mayor, Tracy Braben, and is the first of its kind in our region, uh, yeah. which is very exciting. Um, so you and I had a brief conversation about how we wanted to spend this time because it's it's quite a topical issue, health inequalities at the moment. And it gets sort of, in my experience, two reactions. One is loads of passion, loads of energy, um, and, and sometimes a bit of an eye roll. I think it's fair to say, and here we go again. Um, and I think West Yorkshire Health and Care Partnership have really shown the art of the possible when it comes to health inequalities, yeah. hasn't it? And some of the stuff that you've done. Do you want to just share with folks what, what's been happening? Yeah, I do think it's a very topical thing, and rightly so. Um, um, just this morning, uh, I was meeting all the new starters. So each month, I have a conversation with all new starters about what, what's this partnership for, um, and uh, how do we want to be? So those of you who've seen me before, or have spoken to me before, or work with me, uh, know that I believe that how we work is as important as what we do. And... One of the conversation this morning with about 12, 14 people uh, started with, you know, why do you do this? Why do you do this work? And we had people who worked in administration. We had continuing healthcare nurses. We had children's nurses. We had a various range of different people from clinical, non-clinical backgrounds. And they all talked about making a difference. And several of them talked about making a difference to people with learning disability. People talked about, you know, trying to overcome in the system, the kind of experiences that they'd had professionally or personally in their family lives. So they all came from this place, I thought, which was about how do we how do we do something which we all believe in, which is improve outcomes? How do we do that in the context of something we fundamentally believe in, which is social justice in the NHS? And how do we then visibly uh, see the difference that we're making and have a have a have a system and a and an organization that supports that? So I think for the people who feel cynical or uh, that inequalities is an eye roll moment, then you try and park the cynicism. Because when you talk to people in the organisation, in the system about inequalities, it's actually the thing that I think binds people together. And, and uh, that's me, you know, that West Yorkshire is a partnership of, you know, 10 trusts, six councils, hundreds of GP practices, 13,000 voluntary sector organisations, and the things that bind us together are really important to find. So health inequalities is one of those. Yeah. I'm very happy to talk about the kind of things that we've done subsequently. I mean, you know, I am the first person to say that I think this is one of the best ICSs in the country to work for. And one of the reasons why I always say that is because I feel like every time I come into work, I'm making a difference. And if you think about the people you just mentioned on the induction, yeah. they've all joined this organisation because they want to make a positive difference to the region. But we can't do that, Rob, if we're living in a region where, depending on where you live, your life expectancy yeah. drops. Yeah. Um, or that if you are somebody um, with a learning disability, it drops even more. Yeah. Or if you're somebody who is living with a learning disability and come from a racially marginalised community, that you might not live beyond the age of 40, according to that latest Race Health, uh, Race Health Observatory report. So, you know, and, and I'm apologising for taking one of your catchphrases, but it's barn door obvious why health inequalities are so important and yeah. the power of working across a 2.4 million footprint is because you can take excellent good practice that is working well in small parts of the community and spread it across the region but you were going to mention some other examples of some of the fun yeah. stuff that's going on so so i do think so fundamentally i think you've got to start from a point of agreement and a belief and i don't need to tell this audience i mean i was delighted to hear john and crystal talk about the fact that they're taking people out to see how people live in modern britain 
you know, because everybody in the audience knows that nobody buys new pajamas because you're coming around. Uh, you know, you get what you see is what you get, and you really see how people are coping today. And I always wanted, you know, as a chief exec of a provider, to take people to see how people really live today and the amazing work that our teams do and the inequalities that they see, that you all see right in front of you every single day. Now, if we can build from that, if we can build from that understanding and look at what works, then um, th there's a huge amount we can do in this really difficult context. So we've got a fundamental belief, and now it's now in statute, isn't it? The integrated care systems, integrated care boards have to tackle inequalities. Now, in terms of uh, how we do that, there's two ways to think about it. Firstly, you have to have the right culture, and we've touched on some of that. And secondly, you have to have the right infrastructure. If you don't have a way of working and organizing yourselves, you're not going to get very far. So we've we've really set out by saying, okay, our culture is one where we embrace this. So as you said, Fatima, you know. We, we, we know that these things persist. So people with a learning disability die 20 to 25 years sooner. And a learning disability is not uh, a health condition. So yeah. just think, let that sink in for a second. If you, if you come from, um, you know, a Black Caribbean, Black African community, your experiences of healthcare are going to be worse. If you're a man from that community, you're likely to be in sections 10 times more. That's not a morbidity issue. It's something else. You know, if you've got serious mental illness, you'll die sooner, usually because it's men in middle age, uh, you know, dying by suicide. So mm -hmm. there are shocking things which aren't surprising to us. And our culture is that uh, we should do something about it. Stop admiring the problem. Start doing something about it because we can, because we're a partnership with the NHS, the third sector and councils and our communities. So having that culture then requires the infrastructure. We've got Health Inequalities Academy. That says, if we're going to do something about health inequalities, we have to have insight, we have to have capacity, and we have to have the capability and skills. So on the back of that, we have race equity. Uh, we have health equity fellows looking at race, uh, climate, uh, health equity, deprivation, everything else to build the skills and cap capabilities to, um, to drive things on. And uh, then we also have a range of programs which target and support people with disability, people with serious mental illness, and a range of programs based on ethnicity and deprivation. So those things really drive improvements in health inequalities um, where they can and build the capacity for staff uh, to really be supported uh, to deliver improvements in care. And if we're going to integrate care, we have to integrate the workforce. And, Absolutely. You know, everybody, I, is, is I, there, I can I just check, that? Or is there is there a problem with the sound? I don't know. It? I've just seen in the chat that someone is saying that the sound is poor and, and they've got a really sad face, which has made me very sad. Um, so I've just put in the chat if there are any sound issues, but we've got some feedback from other colleagues that they can. There isn't. It's okay. perfectly fine. Thank uh, you very it's much. Cool. It's, it must um, be the participants end, sorry. Yeah. That's fine. I mean, I would hate for people to miss those words of wisdom from Rob. So, um, and I think it's being recorded as well. So if colleagues have got sound issues, they can watch it again afterwards. Yeah. I mean, just, just going back to what we were just discussing, Rob, about nurses in particular. I mean, I've always found nursing to be a real compassionate side of the health and care system. They are people that go in and out of our homes. They're often the first people we come into contact with. They were certainly the first people that I came into contact with as a carer advocate not so long ago. Um, and they were the people that empowered me with the, the courage, the skills and the expertise to take ownership of my caring situation and later on my own health condition. So we, you know, we wouldn't be anywhere without our nurses and a big shout out today. And one of the reasons we're both so proud to be here. But going back to what we were discussing about integrated care systems and, and the art of the possible, one of the things that I think has been a real step forward recently has been the relationship that we've created between local government and the combined authority about the aspiration for us to look beyond the normal parameters of a health and care system and recognising that actually to address health inequalities, we've got to focus on some of the areas that we don't normally have the opportunity to change, like where people live, like the type of housing that they live in, uh, dare I say, buses and trains today. 
um, the estate that people operate in, the schools that people go to. I mean, all those areas um, are absolutely crucial to our success. And, and I know you're a massive advocate for children yeah. and young people. And we've often said, haven't we, that West Yorkshire's probably got around 20% um, of the current population, but are 100% of our future and, and supporting them in areas that we wouldn't normally consider such as prevention is crucial yeah. um, to our success when it comes to health inequalities. I mean, you know, when we when we decided to support the aspiration to have an inclusivity champion, I remember you and I discussing this and sort of thinking, wow, this could be a really, really big role. But I think what we've created together with the leadership of people like Tracy Braben, our mayor yourself, Kathy Elliott and other leaders is a lens um, and a vision that West Yorkshire should be a region where people feel like they belong, that they can actively participate in society, that inclusion is a lens that we take to everything, including yeah. our education sector, our housing sector, our transport, because we know that that will in turn support better health outcomes. And I suppose, you know, you and I were discussing yesterday, work with the role of health visitors and some of the work that they contribute to um, within our health and care partnership. Do you wanna share a little bit about some of the work that, for example, um, Bev Geary's been leading on our chief nurse or, or Simon Mirza from the Children and Young People yeah, sure. Project Hope. So I think there's some things that our nursing colleagues would be really interested in. Yeah, sure. So I think I can see in the chat there's lots of reflections that we should have housing in integrated care systems. We should make sure that uh, we're focusing on primary care, um, hospitals and so on. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about the children's stuff in a second. I just wanted to re reassure people in the chat that we've got a housing and health program as part of our health inequalities work because we know that um, you know having somewhere to live having someone to love and having something to do are the main drivers of whether you're going to be well or not um, and if you are in a if you're mentally unwell and you've been being sectioned and are, are recovering the thing that's probably been lost to you is your home and uh, what you need to do is to be able to get somewhere to live uh, and providing, you know, simple things like having housing advisors on the wards of inpatient units and mental health um, hospitals is is part of the ways that you can facilitate that. Yeah. And looking at the broader issues around housing, we know that uh, our hospitals have looked at who gets transported to hospital in the ambulance with the ambulance service. We know it, it's not frail older people, it's poorer people from communities where women and children are living in cold, damp houses. So what's the solution to the ambulance crisis? It's stealing the cold, damp houses. Exactly. So it's not having more ambulances. So I think for those in the chat who are thinking that, um, you know, this is just about the NHS, it's really not. And it really is about that inequalities lens being looked at by all partners and people asking the question, why somebody turned up here today? Yeah. And what's at the root cause of it? So to the children's point, because we're a true partnership and because we're led by the people in the partnership, including councils, DASs, DCSs, etc., we, we have conversations about what do we collectively want to do around children. Yeah. One of our 10 big ambitions as a system is to turn the curve on childhood poverty and the consequences of that and childhood obesity, learning from work done in Leeds, which outside of Amsterdam had been the only city and the only place in Europe to manage to do that mm -hmm. with its best city uh, approach and its um, and its work around child friendly leads. Um, so what we've got is a program of work where DCSs, uh, primary care leaders, hospitals, etc., come together to say what do we want to do around children's services? How do we move from a situation where we are, frankly, today, which is for many places our Health visitors and school nurses are so busy doing safeguarding work that they're not doing the interventions that are required. Where CAMS services are stretched and because schools are stretched, there's a tension between schools and CAMS, which people see CAMS as a solution to things which aren't, which are emotional, not mental health issues, because there's nowhere else to go. So we've looked at how do we learn from the best in West Yorkshire, create teams around children which are multidisciplinary, start to look at how we maintain the well-being of children in school and out of school, how we then intervene where people have emotional and well-being issues, how we intervene where people have issues around mental health in a context of extreme pressure. And we've got some 
excellent examples of that. And we're also focusing on people who face the biggest discrimination and impact within that cohort, which is care leavers. So we've got a big piece of work called Project Hope, working with yourself, working with the mayor to see how do we make sure that we, we you know, we make sure people don't go into care unless they really have to. If they do go into care, they get the right kind of support and that we build hope and aspiration, ambition for those children. And you might want to talk a bit about what sort of stuff that having the partnership with the combined authority brings to the party for those children. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I could talk about Project Hope all day. And, uh, you know, if you want to find out more, Google it because you're really, really missing out. But I think one of the practical interventions that you often hear when you speak to looked after children is that feeling that when they leave care, that they feel, you know, without support, without a route, without something to sort of improve their prospects in life. And giving people the opportunity of that first job is really important. But it isn't just about the job. It's about how you get to and from the job. It's about the structure and support around you to develop your capability. So just one practical way of working across these two sectors is the M cards that we managed to secure that supports these young people with transport and able to get to where they need to go. But another fab example of how we're working collaboratively is creating and, and sort of supporting the best infrastructure to enable people to go to and from where they need to go to access care. So things like having citizens advice bureaus on acute hospital sites which support people with information and advice um, that may not be the reason why they're in hospital but might be contributing to the reason why they're there or things like supporting people who are currently pregnant or receiving treatment for cancer with support to and from hospitals we're not relying so much on patient transport services but I think another good example is Leeds becoming a marmot city and it really focusing on some of the attributes or intersectionality that we don't always think about when it comes to people's life expectancy and their outcomes and how actually having the right infrastructure around them is so important and one of the reasons that I'm so passionate about the Marmot City is that it calls out some of the structural inequality that people experience within society and the fact that with the best of intentions sometimes services and structures are not designed and delivered in the way that they should be because the right people are not around the table and some of the things that we've done in our aspiration to have that diverse leadership, and we're really lucky to have you and other leaders as allies role, is you know, the inclusive recruitment toolkit we've created, our aspiration for a diverse leadership, and um, you know, and really sort of pushing our race, you know, equality fellowship, which has been award-winning in its first year and has got, you know, in its first cohort over 80% into executive senior leadership jobs. So all these different things, although they seem tokenistic or maybe fixing one part of the problem, collectively lead to a holistic solution, which is why working across sectors is so important for the success, not only for us in, in health and care, but, you know, society in general. But I also, you know me well enough to know that we can't talk about inequality without talking about personalisation or our own paid carers. And again, nurses are crucial to that success. Yeah. For those of you that don't know what I mean when I talk about personalisation, where have you been? Where have you been? Um, personalization is something that every nurse does naturally and that is about empowering people with the skills expertise and knowledge to look after themselves because if you speak to people that's what they want that's what they want the skills and expertise like and it you know it harnesses innovation it focuses on culturally competent services and it also harnesses the great skills that we've got in our workforce and you know we're really proud to have a program focused on personalization in west yorkshire aren't we Rob? And yeah. I think some of our nursing colleagues have been absolutely instrumental in its success. And I think one of the reasons why it works so well is because it tailors the need and the solution to the patient as an individual. And actually, if you personalise the care, you mitigate the inequality, which is so crucial, isn't it, um, yeah. to our success? Yeah, I agree with that. And, it, and, and you know, we, we know that that's a real strength of community nursing and community teams, particularly when they have the time. And, um, you know, I've, I've, we've all seen, haven't we, the, the way in which community nurses, particularly working with families, can be thinking about much broader things than the health issue. You know, if you go in and dress somebody's legs, for example, it takes a bit of time. You have a chat about everything else that's going on and you've already clocked some of the social and other issues that people might have or their families have and creating um i think 
the true sense of integrated care is when we create an, an ability for people in that situation to say, I've got a team here that can help. So you're not doing it yourself. So, you know, so going out with district nurses, I have, for example, um, you know, I'm finding somebody who's distressed because firstly, something simple has happened, like the sun's come around, put the wash in on the pull-up maid and it's on the ceiling, she can't reach, she can't get out of the chair. So you do it for her, you fold the washing up. And while you're folding the washing up, you find out she's really distressed because the care agency have been ringing, saying they can't come around today. So she tried to cancel them uh, and they're saying there's a, a penalty fee of a thousand quid that she can't afford. But she's found another agency if only she could get over this. So you ring the agency up and say, what are you doing? You know, this falls on individuals to do too often. And what we need to do is to create a system where there's a team that can sort all that out. And it doesn't happen in the first place because mm -hmm. everyone's playing to the to that kind of personalized approach. And as you all know, we're playing to what is it that people want? You know, what is it that people want? So as as and as a as a lady once told me, you know, when I spoke to her about what does she want from us following her stroke, she said, I want to be able to go up the stairs. That's all I want. Oh, you want loads. I just want to go upstairs because first thing I want to go to the toilet. That's where it is. And secondly, I want to spend, I want to go to bed with my husband. I spent 60 years of my life in bed with my husband. We've been married for that long. Yeah. I want to carry on doing that. So that kind of personalization without those kind of goals and ambitions is really what we're about and we hear too much about the bureaucracy of integrated care uh, systems and integrated care boards too much about um you know the structures they're about that really yes. and if we're not about personalization what are we about really exactly and, and i think you know there's a really important message for our audience here which is you know this is what the power of integrated care systems integrated partnership working is it's not about the bureaucracy it's about transcending boundaries to focus on what matters to people but the other part of what matters to people is who matters to people yeah and you know i'm really proud of the fact that we were one of the first icss of the country to have a program solely focused on carers and it was focused in a very inclusive way it recognized the cultural heritage the faith heritage as well as the practical interventions that unpaid carers have been crying out for for a really, really long time. And again, nurses are instrumental in that because they are quite often the only people that a carer sees, the only person that has, you know, the opportunity to sort of advise or help a carer navigate such complexity when it comes to our health and care landscape. Um, but also often sometimes the people that receive that challenge because that carer is really struggling. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. and. Um... Um, you know, if, if anyone's seen um, some of the testimony from carers, you know, when they when they get, you know, any positive endorsement from anybody or thanks, you know, is so much uh, so so gratefully received. I think, yeah. So anyone who's seen Tommy and to us sort of talking about his experience in the day that they he'd been looking after his mum in the day the district nurse put his around around him and said, "You're doing okay." Yeah. So it was like a pivotal moment for him in his in his journey because someone had validated what he was doing because he didn't yeah. know how to do it. You know? And, you know, I have enormous admiration for you, Rob. Um, and we were talking only this morning, actually, of the time that I was quite angry and shouty when I met you for the first time. So the story was, folks, um, that I did not know who the legendary Rob Webster was. I know I was in a rock uh, in a cave somewhere, I'd not heard his name. And Rob had come to do a presentation uh, to the Health and Wellbeing Board while I was chair of Health Watch Kirk Lee. And Rob is always a very charismatic and inspiring speaker. Not really. I, you were you're really good. But I just thought he's not mentioned carers once. And it was really important to me that we mentioned carers. So I remember doing a, a Fatima tra trick move, which folks, I'll warn you now, is one of my, uh, my sort of instinctive things to do, which is I cornered him before he left the town hall. I think I kept you there for about 25 minutes, and I? I did keep you for quite a while. Thank you for giving me that time, Rob. Um, and you, you did that Jedi mind trick that I keep referring to, which I wish more and more leaders would do, which was, you know what? I totally hear what you're saying. And I agree with you. And I would love you to come and help us co-create the solution. 
Now that's quite a brave thing to do. I know you don't think it is brave, but it is because it is a risky thing to do, but it also gives away the power and the resource to the care of the individual to make that change happen. Yeah. So I think everyone on this call will be involved in people who care for somebody. And I think, um, you know, my, my, my first times that I, I, I think as a chief executive going out with community nurses of all, you know, denominations, I'm always blown away by, uh, by the people that we meet. And I can remember everybody that I've ever met, I think on a community visit and some of them live indescribable lives, I think unimaginable lives for me and I'm always humbled by them but I know all of you will be thinking you'll you'll know people as well or you think are absolutely amazing but you'll also worry about them and you just think about the assets that they've got so you understand the value of those carers and of sometimes the fragility of them so we've in West Yorkshire we've got a program of carer support uh, which we deliver with all of our organizations and all of the carers organizations across West Yorkshire because um, there's more people caring for somebody because they love them or they feel a sense of duty than there are staff. Yeah. There's probably three to 400,000 of them. There's 100,000 staff in our two and a half million. Without them, we couldn't deliver anything. So back, again, that comes back to culture and infrastructure. We've got an infrastructure that supports carers. We've got a culture that values them. And we try as much as possible to support them. We know how difficult it is. So in the cost of living crisis, put together a big piece of work with all of the um, councils to coordinate all of our cost of living support work and I think that's really important and critical um, I think some of the other things that we should recognize as well Fatima is that um, we put money into this yeah. you know, so we put money into when, when we have money that comes through the lottery we focus it on inequality areas with inequality when we get our money it goes, all of our money for West Yorkshire goes to the places we don't hold on to it. I don't hold on to it in West Yorkshire. Give it all to the places to deal with. When we got the call 20 plus money, we allocated that money on the basis of how many people lived in the lowest decile. So in nationally, um, you know, you'll all see this. So nationally, what we've got is a position where 20% of people live in the poorest 20% of communities. If you look at that across England or Scotland or Wales, that all makes sense. If you look at it in England, if you look at it in West Yorkshire, 36% uh, of people live in those two deciles, not 20. And 20, actually 22% of people live in the bottom decile and 28% are kids. So the degree of poverty that we've got is substantially greater than the England average. So when it came to allocating that money on the call 20 plus five to target long-term conditions, people who are homeless, et cetera. We targeted that on the basis of the, how many people you got on the lowest decile. So Craven doesn't have anybody in that decile. They didn't get any money. Yeah. Bradford got more money because it's got more people there and we target the work and the resources. So I think because people say, show me your money, I'll show you the strategy. We always focus on the resources as well. It's not just talk. No. Um, to quote the legendary Elvis, Rob, it's a little less conversation, a little more action, please. Uh, that is one of my mantras that you have inspired me to say. Um, thank you for those of you that are getting your questions in. Please keep them coming and we're going to come to them shortly. But there's just two more things that I wanted us to talk about um, before we move to the Q&A bit. The first thing is um, you, you mentioned some of the challenges that people are experiencing within yeah. society. We know that a lot of our workforce are also struggling. A lot of our nurses are really struggling. And um, one of my other roles is that I'm a non-executive director um, at Sheffield Children's Hospital. And on one of my walkabouts, I was told a story that never left me, which was this nurse that works in a critical care unit. She's absolutely amazing, gives some really intense and, and amazing support to some very vulnerable and unwell children. And she was telling me that even though her shift starts at eight in the morning, she arrives at six and sits in a car for an hour and a half just to get a free parking space. Um, and yeah. then when she's walking back to her car, she's too scared to walk on her own at night when it's dark. Yeah. For her own safety. That is the reality of these incredible people that yeah. work within our organisations. The other story that resonates with me is our international workforce. And I remember hearing a story from this amazing Filipino nurse, I'm not going to name her, but she, she came to talk to me about the support she received when she came over. Um, 
and the little family that she created of nurses that sort of create this friendship group and they they supported her to move in and the practical things of like you know where'd you get your halal meat from and where'd you go and watch the Bollywood movies and all, all these things that are really important um and it was the little things that really mattered yeah and I and I just think sort of We've talked a lot about the big ticket issues, haven't we, Rob? But sometimes these small things really matter. Well, it's all about a sense of belonging, isn't it? So the people can get sniffy about things like the long-term workforce plan or the people plan for the NHS, but it starts with a sense of belonging. And, um, you know, I think people on the call will all feel they belong to a team and they belong to their communities and they belong to, to the people that they work with. And it is that those that, that support now now i think what's what's critical for all of us is this sense of leadership in this sort of in this system national you know nationally and locally in all our systems it's got to be servant leadership we've got to start with the people that we're here to help and the people who can help themselves you know so i've got to start with the communities and then the people who support them which is people on this call and everything else is in service of those two groups, the people who need support, the people who can give it to them and how we put them together. So that means that, you know, we need to think about what is it like to work for us? What is it like to work with people in communities? Is that a good experience? Are you being racially harassed or abused? Are you suffering violence? You know, particularly now, if you're a if you're working in a general practice or if you're a community nurse or if unfortunately, you know, people take against, people take against you because of your skin colour still in the 21st century you know we need to know and i think we create the cultures where because we've got good communications from people working for us into decision making and the leadership you should know the stories about somebody who has to park the car at six o'clock to get a free space because they can't afford to pay the parking you should know that people feel unsafe to go home and should start to think about what we can do about it because we can do things about it. We do do things about it um, because this is a, the organization of the system is made of people, yeah. you know, and without the people, we're nothing. But, and, you know, I wouldn't be me if I didn't ask some of the hard questions. Servant leadership. And inclusive leadership's not easy, Rob, is it? You no. make it look easy, but it isn't. Um, and, you know, we've just been through some of the most challenging periods um, in recent memory. We're still in really challenging periods. And we're having to embrace a new way of leading, which is leading through ambiguity, leading through uncertainty, sometimes not having all the answers, sometimes having to show our vulnerability, and sometimes people find that hard. Yeah. So how how do we inspire people? And thank you for the feedback in the chat that people are finding this conversation useful and inspiring. But how how do we continue to support people to lead in the way that you've described and that I've tried to emulate in your shadow? Well, I think we just prove that it works. I think is the key thing. You know, you've got to you've got to prove that it works. And I, I think as a system, we're we're doing okay. Things are incredibly difficult, incredibly difficult for everybody out in the system. Uh, but there's also brilliant things that are going on that people are incredibly proud of. Yeah. And we've got to, we've got to be able, you know, as a, just as an aside, everyone on this call would be doing something where they think I'm really proud of that. You know, I think we're doing some good stuff here. You're all Queen's nurses. You've done, you've done sufficient to prove that you are that some of the best nurses around um, because you're able to do brilliant work. We've got to keep talking about the brilliant work. And then we've got to create the conditions to allow you to succeed. Now, I, I think that as a system in West Yorkshire, we, you know, people come and see what we're up to because they think it's working. And some of the evidence on some of the indicators shows that we're actually doing quite well on some things, but we're not doing well on everything. And I can't, I haven't got all the answers to that. You haven't got all the answers to that. Somebody in the system will have the answers to that. Somebody outside the system Elsewhere, we'll have the answers to that, but we've got to we've got to bring that in. But I think the way that we get the way that we get to prove that this is the right way to lead is to show that it works. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got loads of questions, Rob. Uh, prepare yourself; it's going to feel a bit like question time. And Good. one of them is from Kirsty. Thank you, Kirsty, for taking the time to put a question in the chat. 
You mentioned about how the fact do you work in Hull, awesome, lovely part of Yorkshire, in the homeless health team, and that you sometimes find it difficult to engage with certain communities or get organisations um, to offer appointments or communicate with certain groups, and that you felt quite frustrated about how to point this out. So how can we ensure that health inequalities is everyone's business, I think, and that accessibility is the top of that? Yeah, I think it's because um, I think we just, there are different ways of trying to ensure that people understand that it is, and sometimes that's about language, and sometimes mm -hmm. it's about having infrastructure. For, so for homeless, homelessness and health, um, we do have a West Yorkshire-wide programme of work around homelessness, the vulnerability house, it's linked to the Core 20 plus 5 work, and it's linked to some other work. Um, so, so there's some kind of infrastructure there, but there's also a couple of cultural points. So the, the first on that, using that as an example, um, would be when I was Chief Exec at Leeds Community Healthcare, we ran the York Street practice, which was for, for people who were asylum seek, seeking asylum, who were homeless or were vulnerably housed. And I thought it was absolutely brilliant because it delivered integrated care. So you could get counselling, support, debt advice, health advice, register with a GP, do all your screening, vaccinations, et cetera, for people who've been through some pretty traumatic stuff. So one of the things I encouraged the national team at CQC to do when they introduced the inspection was to inspect it. Can you inspect this as one of the first practices? Because I think it'll come out as it's outstanding. And it did. And what I what I was arguing was if you want to see the best and if you want to see some of the um, practice which is starting to drive what's possible, go to the extremes. And that was one of the extremes. So that's one of the tips. Make the stuff that people think is difficult. Show them that's what's outstanding looks like. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing to do is make it generalizable. Yeah. So and that's sorry to do, do that, I think. I was just going to say as well that one of the things that really broadened my horizons was the influencers connectors that we discovered during COVID. So sometimes it isn't necessarily the service that you're providing or the message that you're trying to say, it's just who you're using to amplify that message. And sometimes using people that work in our amazingly diverse voluntary community social enterprise sector can really support elements of that too. Um, and it, it could be a really cost-effective way to do it. Yeah. Um, so thanks for that question, Kirsty. I've got another one now from Hannah, um, who is a student in school nursing. Thank you uh, for taking that journey. We're really, really grateful that you decided to do that. Can you summarise some key tips on how we can make sure our data collection doesn't unintentionally screw towards our ethnic majorities, informing policy, and therefore widening the gap? Or oh, really good question, Hannah. I don't know the answer, so I'm going to ask Rob. Um, yeah, sure. So I think... Um... Firstly, we have to start using the data. And we have to start not being scared of that. Um, and again, the cultural piece on this is people should just start, should be interested. And um, two examples. So Calder and Huddersfield Foundation Trust, which is part of West Yorkshire, um, the chief exec was thinking about, well, got all these people waiting and they're waiting too long. Um, who is it that's waiting? Can we cut it by deprivation? Can we cut it by ethnicity? And can we cut it by learning disability or not? And because we prioritise patients now, we into categories. You know, P1 you need to be seen now, P2, four weeks, whatever. Um, he said, let's look at P2s. So everybody's been through a clinical decision that they need to be seen within four weeks. So it's not about access. And what he found was that on average, people wait in eight weeks because it's pandemic. We're not able to deliver what we want. Uh, but if you were someone who was for, from a deprived community waiting 13 weeks, 13, 14 weeks, and if you were from uh, a black minority ethnic community, you were waiting about the same sort of 14 weeks. And if you're from a learning, if you had a learning disability waiting longer. So having looked at the data, we've got to sort that out, haven't we? We've got to work out what's going on in our system where we've made a choice, but some people are, are are disadvantaged and then the other example would use is the pandemic we've got to challenge ourselves uh the pandemic around vaccination do we think the vaccination campaigns have been successful well in aggregate yes 
But if you look at a risk profile and say, well, have they targeted the people who are most at risk, those who live in deprived communities, those of Black Caribbean, Black African, Bangladesh and Pakistani heritage, um, they're not being successful because the numbers in those communities go on a slide and scale downwards towards sort of 50% coverage. So I think we have to start using the data and we have to be courageous to ask ourselves the questions. And when the answers come up, we have to be even more courageous and say, well, is it us then? Who's causing the problem? Is it us? We can't blame somebody else. We must be doing something wrong. Let's get it right. And, you know, I remember when we first started having that conversation, there were some people that were nervous about it because yeah. sometimes addressing inequality means that people have to give something up. Yeah. Yeah. But doing the right thing is never easy. And actually, we've shown that the art of the possible means that the right people get care, but also it's not to the detriment of others. And I think yeah. that's a really, really important message that, you know, you can address inequalities without making it worse for everyone else. Yeah. It's just a slightly different way of working. Yeah. Um, so another question which I found really interesting from DLG 16, um, which is about profound inequalities represented in the populations living in custodial settings. And will integrated care systems help to address these, do you think? And the reason why this was interesting to me, Rob, is because, as you know, working in the mayor's office means that I'm particularly close now to the police crime commissioner, our deputy mayor, Alison Lowe, um, who is incredible, by the way, Google her, she's amazing. And we're starting to do some work, particularly focusing on mental health interventions and how we support people in a meaningful way. So uh, it, it, sort of my response to this when I was reading it was actually there's quite a lot we can do. I mean, we've got an incredible mental health LD and autism program led by Sarah Munro, one of our chief execs and NPA, uh, one of our AADs. And they're working really closely with a combined authority, really. Oh, Donna, thank you for telling me your name. I was like, why is she not telling us her name? Um, and actually, that's the art of working in this integrated way is the ability to cross different sectors and to work with, you know, public sector organisations like the police. And we've done so much stuff on trauma informed work, haven't we, Rob? I mean, yeah. we needed a yeah. whole other session, wouldn't we, yeah. quite frankly? Yeah, trauma informed work is really important. So with the West Yorkshire Violence Reduction Unit, we've been we're three years into a pro 10 year programme to become a trauma informed system. And um I think talking to some of the prison staff at the Youth Offending Institute in Weatherby, which is the biggest children's prison in Europe, um, they, they, the insights that they got going through the training were really interesting. You know, some of them were you know, very, very challenged, I think, and quite emotional when they really started to work out what had happened to some of the boys that they were supporting and looking after. Um, so those sorts of interventions are really powerful. And, and I'll also never forget talking to this, a uh, speech and language therapist at Leeds Community, because we used to run the prison healthcare services too, uh, about the work that they've been doing with some of the boys, uh, many of whom have a learning disability. Um, if you look at the proportion of children in prison who have a learning disability, it's pretty shocking and are unable to express themselves very well. Um, but they were saying that, you know, at, at least they were able to understand what was going on and express themselves in court, including one of them famously said, I managed not to tell the judge to F off. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Kirsty, for the Swifty reference. And I don't think, uh, for those of you that don't know what Swifty is, it's a, a Taylor Swift fan. Uh, see, I am down with the kids, folks. Um, you are not the problem. And the problem is not you. It's just we need, we're on a journey together to try and develop the solutions yeah. together. And, and that's why having conversations like this are, are so important. So I'm going to go to our final question, uh, Rob, because I'm mindful of the time and we could be here talking all day because we were so passionate about this, aren't we? And it's from Elaine Goodwin. Thank you, Elaine, for your question. Um, she's asking about what our advice would be uh, and how would we get to a place where Personalised care applies to everyone, and no matter where you live, whether it's round here in Leeds, nice one, loving the fact that you're from Leeds, and Leeds, um, or someone living on the street and ensuring that everyone gets the same access. I mean, the first thing I would say is, and I, I've said it earlier, personalised care is the answer to health inequalities because it tailors the care to the individual. But part of the issue is giving people access to personalised care. And there's an element about 
cultural competence as well as inclusive leadership here and I think we're really in a fortunate position that our nurses are so diverse and have such diverse heritage as well as lived experience which can really really support this. I think the other thing I'd say before bringing Rob is, is the power of things like continuing health care. So as somebody with lived experience of caring or as one of the first adopters of getting that source of revenue, it was life changing because it enabled me to employ people who spoke the language that my mother-in-law spoke, uh, that gave her care that met her cultural and faith needs. And more importantly, if I can say that, it gave my family their life back because we could not access care otherwise. Um, and it gave us the flexibility of going out on a Saturday afternoon to the park with my children. Um, so I really think continuing healthcare gets a really bad rep. I think it's life-changing and, and we need to amplify it and use it wherever we can. But Rob, what do you think um, is a way in which we can really ensure that everyone gets access to personalised care? Because it's so important. Yeah, so I think, um, so first, First thing to say is that I think that's what integrated care systems are for. You know, so modern modern systems need to help deliver um, and meet the mental, physical, and social needs of people. And we all know that, don't we? You all see that all the time. It's the mental, physical, and social needs of people with people out, we're not body parts. And all those things intertwine, and we need to be create. We need to integrate the workforce and integrate care so that people can have access to the kind of team that allows them to take the dog out for a walk, go to the pub, go to work, look after the kids, whatever it is that they need to do whilst keeping mentally well and physically well. Um, so firstly, the sort of slightly trite thing to say is it's got to be at the heart of what we do and what we're for. We're not here to performance manage, just performance manage hospitals. That's not the job. The job is to improve outcomes and to meet the mental, physical and social needs of people. Then the second thing I would point everybody to is there's a really nice, well, it's not nice, it's challenging and powerful report that's been published today by the uh, London um, Business School, London University Business School, which they did in conjunction with us and with Sussex. NHS Sussex uh, and a lot of academics, which looks at how do you deliver universal healthcare? And the first finding of that is that a flat offer is an unequal offer. So if we're, if we're just saying, look, you just get this, then what we get is what we've got today, which is massive inequalities, which leads to significant substantial problems now and down the line. So have a look at that report. We'll, we, we're using it to further change what we're doing because we're still not going to get it right all the time and things change all the time. So I think it, the, the, the answer to the question, Fatima, is we've got to make this at the heart of what ICS is for. And then we've got to keep challenging ourselves on how we do it. Because yeah. as we always say, real change happens in real work. Absolutely. Otherwise it's just hot air. Or a little, your Elvis quote's better, obviously. <laughs> no, but you know what? What I really love is we always start the conversation with our vision. And health inequalities is always a part of that. Yeah. And then we talk about our values and our behaviours, and that is a part of it too, that we absolutely yeah. value and celebrate our diversity. So, so that they're the things. I mean, we could talk about this all day, but I'm mindful we're between people's lunch, uh, and I would never, ever want to get in the way of that. I have been really cheeky, and I've put Rob's uh, ex, uh, hashtag on there and my own, so feel free to answer the conversations. Rob and I are on Twitter quite a lot. Uh, we do like um, sort of having conversations and continuing things. But I think there are some important messages that we, we maybe want to just close with, Rob, um, and I'll come to you in a second. I think the first thing is integrated care systems are the embodiment of the art of the possible when it comes to health inequalities and the benefits that collaborative partnership can bring. It is also a really good enabler to address some of the social injustices in society. And, you know, we've given numerous examples of how we've intervened that through our workforce, as well as some of the wider determinants of health. But what we've also been really honest about is that it's not easy. Yeah. Um, but that's why having conversations like this are important, because it gives people hope um, and shows that, yes, you can keep going. And uh, every time I'm with you uh, in, in conversations relating to work, one of the mantras that you always repeat is we've got to follow the hope. We've got to keep shining that light and motivating people to continue. And then the final thing I will say is this isn't over. 
you know, um, we're at the start of a journey. And sometimes demonstrating some of the outcomes that we want to on health inequalities will take time. But that's the reason we exist. And we're not backing down anytime soon, are we? What are your thoughts? No, I think that's 100% right. I think um, just the, the two final observations for me. So firstly, um, you, there's always a way to shift the agenda, to reframe things into somebody else's space. So, you know, Crystal, and I always re remember that, you know, one of, the, one of the things that helped me in Leeds 10 years ago as the chief exec of a community trust was when I started talking to the hospital about beds. And that's anathema to us in community services often, isn't it? But so they'd be saying, well, you know, we've, we're 50 beds short and, you know, we've only got 460 beds. So I'd say, well, I've got 3,000 beds. They're just in someone's house. Mm. And they've got a team with people looking after somebody in their bed at home. And they started to get, oh, they get it now. I get it. Oh, I get it. I get what you're doing now. And and in health inequalities, we, we need to sort of start saying to people, think about, well, who's just turned up in the ambulance and why? And how can we make sure they don't? And it's, it makes things better for you. Because there's always a health inequality element to it. It is deprivation. It is having a learning disability. It is serious mental illness. Unfortunately, it's still ethnicity you know, that drive the poor experiences of people. And we can get into a conversation with anybody in their context about a and &E, about waiting times, about anything that can come back to inequality. So that's the first thing I'd say. I think the second thing I'd say is um, thank you. Thank you to everybody on this call because, uh, you know, my job's easy in comparison to yours. I mean, you're, you're dealing with huge amounts of, you know, stress, pressure, hope, ambition, you're seeing great things every day and you're dealing with really difficult things every day. Um, you're in a sector which has faced huge pressures. You, you've been you've been there whilst there's been more deaths in England, Scotland, Wales during the pandemic. And you've been there where there's been an increasing number of people dying at home. You know, you've been there for people who are facing significant, substantial issues around the cost of living crisis and provided support and hope to them you know you do that every day and you don't get the plaudits for it that you should so i'm just thought i should use a little bit of my time just to say thank you i mean he's so smooth isn't he but absolutely could not agree with you more rob and also a special shout out to the legendary fiona rogers one of west yorkshire's health and care partnerships own which is now doing amazing things for the q and i and um, i just want to thank Crystal and Adina and all the Q&I team for the opportunity for us to facilitate a conversation. This, this has been completely unscripted. Uh, we've just gone where the conversation has taken us and we really appreciate the Q&I giving us the chance to just have a conversation about the things that matter. And thank you to all of you for your, your hard work, but also the interactivity with today. I really felt like we were having a conversation with a bunch of people rather than talking to each other on a screen. So thank you. Thanks, See you Brilliant. Don't disappear, both of you, um, for, for, for one second. Um, thank you so much. Um, as ever, um, everybody's really inspired by your leadership approach and your understanding about what happens out there in community services. Um, Rob, we want you as Prime Minister. Will you stand for election? And, and, and then Fatima can be the Secretary of State for Health. In a heartbeat. <laughs> I've said this to him all the time. I'm like, I will, I will coordinate your campaign. I will get the stuff done, but sadly, he's just not interested. I mean, being George's dad is a full-time job, isn't it, Rob, I suppose? <laughs> um, uh, just one very, very quick question that, that you didn't pick up in the chat panel. Um, so not every ICB has got such inspired and uh, insightful leadership, shall we say. I presented at a conference in, in the North to an ICB who were surprised to see that I'd managed to, managed to extract from the programme ambulance uh, an issue that they, you know, was about a care pathway that didn't work. Um, and, and so uh, how, how can we get these people to realise that they need to get out there and actually see what happens on the ground? Um, uh, Rob, I think your suggestion about how many beds is, is a great one. If you talk the language back to them, a lot of them are accountants. So I'm not sure I know the language about money. As a former director of nursing, I usually told them about being underfinanced rather than overspent. <laughs>
<laughs> um, but 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 how can we get people to to take up the offer to shadow community staff or to to look at what happens to meet with people to get that kind of insight? I think just making the offer is always good, John. I think most people would take it up, and um, when they do, they they often have an epiphany. I remember a, a director of nursing um, from an acute hospital in, talking to me when I was in a national role uh, from another part of the country saying that uh, she'd run a very large tertiary service, been the director of nursing, a very large tertiary service, which had, had, had picked up some community services and she went out with them and um, she came back and said, I thought I knew what nursing was. I had no idea. I had no idea about risk and risk management until now. And it's changed the way I think. So I think you, people will will generally go out, particularly if it's part of something. You can always tailor it to something that they think is a benefit to them. But generally, I think um, if you you know if you think about some of the stuff we're dealing with, what have we be, what have I been doing this week? I mean, it's some brilliant stuff like the Women of West Yorkshire sessions with the mayor and Tracy yesterday. But I've also been dealing with restructuring and strikes. I'd rather be out with some community nurses looking at what they're up to. So I think people people will pick it up. Just ask. Pat, did you want to come in? I saw that yes. you hand so, up here. So firstly, Crystal, you're absolutely right. My apologies. I assume that the whole world knows who uh, George Webster is. But if you don't, Rob's son, and he's absolutely nationally award-winning presenter um, for CBBC. Um, I just wanted to sort of respond to the question, John. I think part of the answer is what job, uh, which Rob's just described, but I also think it's about diverse leadership. So, you know, if you've, and I don't mean by heritage, I mean lived experience. So, you know, I'm a non-exec director and I was a patient advocate and a carer and I take back to the floors really seriously. I take, I think it's really important that we go out and we visit our services and we speak to patients about what it feels like, but we also as part of my role of chairing the people committee, have our staff come in and talk to us as well um, and share with us what it's like to be out there because it needs to be a two-way conversation um, and we need to know where people are rather than expecting them to come and find us. So I think it's a combination of things. And although in West Yorkshire, we've talked about our journey to be a diverse leadership, we have got more to do. And part of that is ensuring that the leadership we have on our boards is as diverse as it can be in a range of ways, including professions. And I think senior nurses in leadership roles can change the dynamic of a board. So to everyone on the call, aim high. You know, the, there is no glass ceiling as far as I'm concerned. Great, thank you very much both for an inspiring session and, and great advice about how to potentially influence how, how things are turning out. And mm -hmm. um, we probably all want to come work in Yorkshire now. Um, so, or, or could we just move the boundary? Can, will you take in the northeast? <laughs> the north, we could be the north riding, just make it bigger. Yeah. I'll have a chat with Leah, <laughs> she's next door, I'll see what she says. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very, very much indeed for, for, for your um, insight and, and presentation. Thanks, everybody. Okay, everybody, we now have a, a lunch break. Um, so please do go back to the lobby and check out the exhibitor booths. Uh, all their resources can be um, downloaded from those booths. Um, so while you're having lunch, if you want to have a little look around, if you go back to the VFAIRS lobby, you can have a look at the various resources that are there. So the break is until 13.45, so quarter to two. And when you come back, you'll have an option to join a roundtable session led by our wonderful Queen's nurses. There are a large range of, of sessions. We have decided to maximise attendance at the sessions, not to show the um, interview with Professor Alison Kitson. But if you didn't manage to see that on the two occasions that it was available yesterday, you will be able to see it after the event on the VFAIRS platform. So if you wish to join the roundtables after the break, please click on the roundtables tab at the top bar and it'll take you to a page where you'll be able to see and choose from the range of roundtables discussing various subjects. The first roundtable will start at 13.45 and finish at 10 past two and the second one starts at uh, 2.15 and finishes at uh, 20 to three, okay? Um, so, and there's a slide on the screen to uh, confirm that information to you, which we will leave up. And then after the 
uh, round table sessions if you go back into the lobby lobby and click on auditorium and we will then continue with today's session so enjoy your lunch break and um, and see you uh, a little bit later on thanks session is on sustainability in healthcare and we're delighted to be joined by Sir Muir Gray. Um, Sir Muir's profile is in the agenda which you can access via the lobby and he is joined in this session by uh, Rachel Stancliffe who's the Chief Executive of the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare and Siobhan Paslow-Williams who's the QI Education Lead at the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare. Um, so we're going to go straight into this session and um, following the session, there will be an opportunity to ask any questions. So just as a very, very quick reminder to use the Q&A tab rather than the chat panel if you want to raise questions for the presenters. Good afternoon, uh, Muir. Uh, Good afternoon. We're going to hand over directly to yourself. So very warm welcome and to Siobhan and Rachel. So I don't know who's kicking off, but um, you're free I'll, to I'll start. Can, can, um, you, can you hear me clearly? We can, Muir. Absolutely. Good. Thank you. Well, it's, it's wonderful to be here. Um, about ha half my life is to do with living longer better. And the other half is to do with what I call better value healthcare. And district nurses are of vital importance in helping people live longer better. And I also use them a lot when I'm speaking about better value healthcare. They're the one service I never have any doubt about the fact they're doing high value work. District nurses don't waste their time. They're out there and they're doing high value work. So whenever I see waste in the health service, and there's a hell of a lot of it, I'm thinking not only of the carbon, but I'm also thinking well, this could be invested in district nursing. So it's a great honor, pleasure, and privilege to be here at the Queen's Institute. I can picture the door and um, the offices and the staff. So it's fantastic to be here to speak to the people who I regard as very, very high value. And we're going to speak about sustainability. And there's two meanings of the word. One is the sustainability of the NHS, and it is not sustainable if we waste money. And we're probably spending about a billion pounds a year in drugs that do no good, and in fact do more harm than good. And it'd be wonderful if we could even switch 100 million pounds of that to district nursing. And we use sustainability in the broader sense, uh, meaning sustainability of life on earth. And the two are interconnected. And that's the reason we set up the centre in Oxford, Rachel, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, a long time ago, called the Centre for Greening the NHS. And Rachel now heads the, the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare. And this, I'll start, I'm just going to ask Rachel a few questions so she can tell you um, about the key issues before Siobhan speaks. So well, what is it we say to clinicians, Rachel? Why, why is the environment important? Thanks very much, Mio, and hi, everybody. Um, Dina, are you, oh, great. I was gonna say, are you able to just, uh, and click to the next one if you don't mind, thank you. 
Okay, so just say very, very briefly, Muir's introduced uh, the centre. So we've been working for 15 years now, Muir, over 15 Gosh. years. <laughs> That's amazing, isn't it? Um, and we've been supporting the healthcare sector to, to lead and to model climate action. Next slide, please. Uh, we have uh, quite a few programmes, and these are some of the main ones. Uh, um, sustainability and quality improvement. We have a green team competition. We do impact analysis. Um, we have a great green space for health program. And we'll talk a bit more about some of these uh, later on. Okay, next slide, thanks. So Muir's question is, um, what's this got to do with uh, healthcare professionals in working in health? Um, so next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we we are all people um, and we are all part of uh, the, the ecosystem and it's helpful I think for us to think not only about us as people but us as as working in healthcare and how healthcare intersects with all these different layers so obviously if we're talking to uh, a nurse specializing in kidney care you you focus down on a part of the body but actually um, with outside uh, the whole of um, the work that we do are several more layers of um, impact and influence on what we do both in our work and in our everyday lives. So you'll see here it's not just um, physical things such as uh, the, the buildings we work in and the air and the water that we that we breathe and drink but it's also uh, the social capital. So the communities that we are part of, which are really, really important. So when we understand that, and we understand that health is a really, really uh, integrated part of the natural environment, then it doesn't take uh, much to understand that if that environment's being uh, degraded and um, the, at risk, basically, that our health is also at risk. So um, next slide, please. Actually, that's, uh, yeah. Okay, so keep going. Thank you. So um, we, we all obviously depend on the natural environment um, and, the, and the climate emergency that we're in is, is the biggest threat to our health at the moment. So this is not just about uh, carbon dioxide and you'll all have heard of about net zero and the efforts of the NHS to, to take us down to net zero. Um, which is one of the symptoms of the climate emergency. Um, but it's also that planetary boundaries are being crossed all the time. So we, we can see here that how the rising temperatures and the extreme weather events that we're seeing uh, have immediate effects in terms of severe weather, obviously uh, water quality and environmental degradation, extreme heat and so on. Um, and that these in turn have huge effects on, uh, on our health, on human health. So just mentioned on here are mental health impacts, uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, respiratory illnesses, uh, as well as um, malnutrition and so on. Um, and there's a very nice moving version of this, but it can it can uh, take up a lot of um, bandwidth. So I've, I've left the, the still one here for you. OK, next slide, please. And uh, keep going, uh, because health um, is part of the problem. So the other reason that we need to be concerned about that, um, there's a bit more there, is is that the, the health care that we do, um, and all of us care uh, for, for lots of different people in lots of different ways, but all of that health care mounts up to a lot of damage to the environment. So not only is the problem affecting our health, but health care is affecting the problem and is part of that problem. Um, and of course, we don't want to be doing that. Okay, so have I answered your question, Muir? Is it... Is, um, is there anything else that you'd like me to go through in terms of why it's uh, why it's our business? Well, it's really um, thinking a little bit in the, the general sense at the moment about, uh, I'm sure people will be interested in you know, the debate about how, how far down the road are we and is it too late to do anything? What do you feel about that? 
Uh, yeah, so I've got a couple of slides later on about, about how far we are down the road. So um, it's definitely not too late. Um, mm -hmm. And um, what, what are the effects? Are, I mean, you've you mentioned some of the effects, but uh, are these changes in weather? Can they all be put down to the changing environment or does, it, does the environment not changed over the centuries and millennia anyway? Um, good question, and we I haven't got slides on this because, yeah. um, but, but it's there's a lot there is a lot of information out there on this, so we have very very good records now um, showing how our behaviour so human behaviour has affected the climate, mm -hmm. and although we do get a lot of variation over the centuries, obviously um, we can clearly demonstrate that from the industrial revolution on there is an increasing and uh, exponentially increasing, unfortunately, impact that we're having on the environment. Um, and I think we all, I think we can see that. We know that, you know, the rivers are full of uh, effluents, but also of, of seas are full of plastic. We have lots and lots of um, visual information, but we also have lots and lots of scientific information now. So the IPCC report that was published in 2018 by hundreds of scientists worldwide um, clearly documents this and clearly documents what we need to do in order to stay within a safe uh, limit for our health, which is basically to um, reduce carbon dioxide emissions and other uh, environmental impacts in the next 15 years or so. Yes. So... Um, and... and um... Where do you see us uh, in, in in terms of optimism or or pessimism? I mean, is it still possible to do something? And uh, Siobhan will speak a bit more about what we're doing, but uh, we hear different things in the news about where we are in the, the progress, 2030, 2050. Yeah. Are, you, are, you, are you still full of hope after spending your last 15 years reading a lot of fairly depressing documents. Yeah. Um, okay, so if we go on, if we go on through these slides, uh, maybe Adina, that would be really kind. Thank you. So I was just going to say that it is, you know, it's not just a, a global problem. I mean, it is a global problem, but it's also affecting us in the UK here. So air pollution, I think heat waves killed excess deaths for about three and a half thousand here last year in the UK and we're seeing new diseases like Lyme's disease, uh, tick-borne encephalitis and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, I literally took a picture of a mosquito on my screen this morning, <laughs> mm. <laughs> a big mosquito. Um, yeah. So it's coming, you know, Paris had a, has eradication for um, uh, malaria and so on uh, already um, starting. And the other thing I wanted to mention briefly, Muir, is before we go on to the good stuff, is um, eco-anxiety because you know, we see a lot, I've got youngish children still, um, and we see a lot in our in our younger, um, well, in our youth, I think, of eco-anxiety, and to some extent in, in the rest of the population as well. And, uh, you know, we, I think we need to be aware as healthcare professionals of that, and to treat it with respect, and to basically say that, to validate it, so to say that it's right that people feel worried about this, um, and that actually there are lots of things that we can still do. Um, and there is a lot of support uh, out there for people feeling these issues because, you know, some, some of our children aren't having children themselves because they're worried about the future, which is obviously a horrible, um, horrible situation to be in. Um, and also I just wanted to quickly mention that climate migration is already starting. Um, a lot of the reasons that people are moving already is if not triggered by, uh, definitely exacerbated by climate change um, and then the need for climate justice so again a lot of people will be aware of this but just to mention briefly that it climate injustice is huge so the the countries that have caused the biggest problems in uh, man-made climate change are the ones that are suffering the least because they are the richest because they've built their wealth on the degradation of the environment so the industrial revolution has obviously benefited um the UK and America and other other countries at the expense of some of the rest of the world, a lot of the rest of the world, and it is those countries who are most vulnerable to climate change. So that's just an important thing to note and be aware of when we're 
thinking about how we deal with this, um, not only in this country, but uh, internationally. Um, so you, you asked about the good things, um, and sorry, I didn't mean to, to go on so long about the negatives, but um, let's have a next slide, Adina, and then um, that's just to say that, yeah, we, I think you, I'm sure you all know in this audience that, that the health sector is vulnerable to this. Um, and there's lots more, of inf more information out there about, about all of this if you, you are interested. Um, so, you know, we are already seeing flooding and heat waves affecting how hospitals can, um, can function. And those incidences are becoming more and more um, uh, frequent. So I know that, for example, I think there were, I think, well, I've got this figure somewhere, it's like 5555. Five, 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 so that's over five and a half thousand um, overheating incidences last year in, in the UK, which affected care. So it's happening all the time. Uh, on we go. So it's not too late. Um, on we go. And um, it's not too late because uh, we have um, we have about 10 years, 10 to 15 years in which to make big, big changes. And the role of the health sector in this is really, really important. So we can model change. We can show that it's possible to reduce our carbon and the NHS has quite strong carbon reduction targets. Uh, set out by the Greener NHS and uh, people are being supported to implement changes to make those. Um, we can also use our influence in wider society so we can advocate for change at local and uh, level in our communities but also in, uh, in work which in some ways um, does uh, require a change of culture. We can educate ourselves and others. Uh, we can use the purchasing power that we have uh, within the NHS to improve the supply chain, which is really important because procurement's a big, big part of this. Um, and we can try and include sustainability in as many places as possible. So in policy, for example. Um, so this is just to say that we can't, so in, if we want to reduce our carbon footprint and our effect on the environment, we need to understand what it is and where it's coming from. So I know, Muir, that when we started working, um, we were really, in 2008, we were really surprised to find out that only about 20% of the whole of the impacts of healthcare on the environment were coming from the buildings and the energy directly from those buildings it's themselves because we were like this you know those huge great buildings they're going to have the most um, impact but it's mm -hmm. in fact, um, they are about 20 percent transport is about 15 percent and all the rest is from the clinical work that's done in those uh, buildings so you can see from this graph that um, medical instruments and pharmaceuticals are a massive part of that and actually, when we talk about, you know, how important it is to recycle, it is important, but you'll see that it's right at the end of that graph there. So it is, um, you know, recycling is, is the last thing that we should be doing, although we should be doing it well, of course. Um, but looking at how we spend our, um, our budgets in terms of the stuff that we, that we use and the stuff that we throw away, all the time is really, really important. And as you said, Mira, it's very, very linked. So um, if we're using a lot of resources, we are spending a lot of money and we have less, less time for staff. So we have more time, more money for stuff. We have less time for staff. Um, okay, next slide, please. Um, and this, I, I find this helpful. I'm quite a visual person. And, and for me, this is a useful way of thinking how on earth are we going to get down to net zero because you know the, the trajectory as we're on at the moment is increasing slightly even so we have to do a lot of different things because of aging population and so on increasing needs so we have to do a lot of things um, and I won't go through all of that but what's important if you click the next slide is to note that quite a lot of these things are actually um, to to do with uh, clinical leadership and in innovation, so it's it's not um, it's not just going to be decarbonising the grid, and it's not going to be um, 
taking uh take taking different parts of the health system and making them net zero without the involvement of healthcare professionals it's absolutely vital that we get nurses doctors and others on board in terms of making those changes um, because they are the people using these resources um so you know the nursing is the largest profession uh and it, we think it's uniquely placed. It's really important that, um, you know, if, if you need any support with that, if you have any questions about any of this, that uh, we try and help to, um, to give you the information that you need. Um, so, yeah, thank you, Muir. Yeah. Well, it's there's very, very okay. comprehensive. We'll get, we'll get questions, keep the questions uh, coming in. And there's a, a, a thing on the screen you can use to send questions as well as put them in the chat. And I but, think I was, there was there was also there's also a bit there about and I'm not sure um, if it's if it's kind of keep going a minute because I think there are some bits there about um, about co-benefits as well. So that's yes, important keep, before yes, before. Uh, what, to, what, 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 what do you mean by co-benefit? co-benefits so so basically things that will um that will improve health at the same mm -hmm. time as improving the environment so things that we do and some of these are lifestyle things they may be things which are within the health care system but they may also be things in our communities that we can advocate for um so we have quite a lot of evidence now around um some of these activities and if you go to the next slide i'll just show you what we're doing about them in at the center so we have a, a whole green space for health um, program. And that started, as you know, Muir, with the NHS Forest, which you were really instrumental in, in starting up uh, all those years ago. And we started with a very, very simple premise, which was we, we were going to, um, an idea, we were going to uh, plant one tree for every staff member in the NHS. Well, we haven't quite made it, but um, we've- We're we've going, done we're going. Yeah. We're going, yeah, we're going and we've done 100,000 trees and we're doing 150,000 over the next year or so. We've got some funding for that. So we've got trees if people want them, um, want to plant them. And we've also uh, developed a range of other programmes around that, which include having nature ranges on, on hospital sites, uh, working with communities and GPs to have green health routes and maps and so on. Um, and lots of lots of other nice uh, nice projects. So do have a look at the NHS Forest website for more of those ideas. Um, and I think is there one last slide or yes, okay. So that's again an old slide. You'll probably recognise it. You'll have seen it um, elsewhere, hopefully. But this is the thing. This is the thing about co-benefits. That what if we're doing all this stuff and. You know, I mean, this was written 15, 20 years ago when people were still saying, oh, climate change isn't real. So there was more of a reason for having it. Um, but actually, this is about co-benefits because all the things we're doing are nicer to, to live with. They are better for the environment, which means it's better for our health. It's better for our children. It's better for our mental health as well as our physical health. Um, so, yes, I think that's quite enough from me. Thanks, Mia. <laughs> <laughs> well, what we've had there is an overview of what the problem is and what we're trying to do about it. And I think when we, we look forward, we need to understand this is very much tied up with the future of the NHS. And we use the word stewardship a lot. But stewardship is stewardship of the NHS. Don't waste the NHS resources. And stewardship of the, of the planet. It's an old-fashioned word of stewardship, but it's now widely used. And of course, the best example of its use is in the stewardship of antibiotics. We've overused antibiotics, and it said um, we're now reaping the the whirlwind that's coming from there. But I met someone at the weekend. It had both cataracts done, and hadn't noticed any difference. And I said, "Well, why did you have your cataracts done?" Well, the optician said um, I had a cataract, so he just sort of got into the the pipeline and um, all high quality work, but it hadn't improved the quality of his life at all. The number of MRIs done has increased uh, about five times in the last 10 years. And you know, young doctors are now ordering MRIs before they've spoken to the patient. So these are huge issues that 
uh, to do with the changing nature of clinical practice. And this is what we've been very keen to do, is to see the role of the clinician in this. Now, um, district nurses are, uh, are mostly in the, in the audience today. I mean, I remember district nurses on bikes, but it is not possible now. Uh, you, you, you have to be in the car. Um, you've got to carry your equipment with you. And you're seeing highly dependent people and keeping them out of hospital. So you're already working, I think, at the limits, but we're been seeing the discussion to see if you are using the, 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 the menu of things that Rachel described, how you can come up with suggestions. But before we open it out, we're now going to hear from Siobhan about uh, the work that's going on in, in various specialties and particularly thinking about the, the NHS itself as how we can change. And there are many, many benefits for me and my work in value-based healthcare um, it's to do with waste. And I don't want to put, I'm not going to save money. I want to shift resources from low value activity to high value activity. And as I said, yeah, that would <laughs> the one thing I'm sure about uh, district nurses. So let's hear more now from Siobhan. Thanks, Mia. Um, would it be possible to share the slides? Or I can share. Um, I'm not sure which slide was it. Um, uh, 55. Yeah. Fine. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Lovely. So, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm the SASQI Education Lead at the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare. I'm also a nurse by background, so um, it's really great to be able to speak to nurses about this issue. And what I want to talk about is what you can do in your everyday practice and give you some examples of um, some case studies which have used um, the sustainability and quality improvement framework um, to make some changes in practice. So next slide, please. So what can we do as health professionals? So nurses are ranked as the most trusted profession um, for the 20th year in a row. Um, so we can really use our voice and uh, influence in this area and make big changes. Uh, there's also, we're the biggest um, workforce within the health system. We work in all the sectors and we're always patient facing. There's 27.9 million nurses, I think, which was the last count from the World Health Organization. Uh, so if we're all doing small manageable steps, we can make a real big difference within this area. Next slide, please. So it's one thing uh, knowing about the problem um, and the need for sustainable health care, but the reason uh, SUSQI, which is sustainability and quality improvement was developed, was to really uh, enable us to take action within our scope of practice that is manageable and scalable and um, sort of smart in terms of goals. Next slide, please. So historically, sustainability has sat with estates and facilities, but as you've seen, uh, a lot of the carbon footprint comes from medical equipment, pharmaceuticals, uh, gases, um, anaesthetic gases, etc. Uh, so we really want to sort of move uh, sustainability as part of quality improvement and into clinical innovation. Next slide, please. So talking about quality, so uh, the Royal College of Physicians uh, recognize that sustainability is a core domain to quality 
that it must run through and moderate all other uh, domains because we really need to make sure that not only is healthcare sustainable and um, addressing the needs of today, but we also need to make sure that our healthcare system is sustainable for future generations. Next slide, please. So this is uh, the equation that we use in SOSQI, and it's really thinking about sustainable value. So as Muir said about the cataract surgery, you know, it's um, a high quality uh, intervention, but actually, for example, with a patient who had the cataract surgery, it didn't improve his quality of life. So uh, it could be seen as a low value intervention. So what we want to be doing is focusing on interventions uh, that increase health outcomes for patients and populations. And equally, we want to take in these bottom line um, elements. So we want to decrease the environmental impact, hopefully decrease financial impacts. Usually what's good for the ecology is good for the economy. And uh, we want to add social value at every opportunity. So this isn't an equation that we uh, sort of come out with a numerical um, uh, answer, but it's really worth kind of bearing in mind these different domains. Next slide, please. So this is the SUSQI framework and it's been designed to uh, be integrated within current quality improvement methodology. So if you're, um, uh, aware of quality improvement, for example, the model for improvement, uh, the PDSA cycle. Uh, this is designed to uh, enhance those models and um, to be included within it. So it's broken down into four simple steps. So setting goals, studying the system, designing the improvement, and finally measuring the impact of sustainable value. Next slide, please. So this is the principles of sustainable clinical practice. So when we're thinking about improvements that we want to make within our uh, sort of area of practice and within our scope of what we can do, uh, we first of all want to maybe uh, focus on prevention. So these are numbered in order of priority. So the the most effective uh, healthcare is no need for healthcare and, and people being healthy. Uh, so promoting health. Uh, so this could be um, immunization programs, um, bowel cancer screening programs, that kind of thing that prevent ill health. If we can't prevent it, we look at patient self-care, so empowering patients to take a greater role in their uh, health and managing their symptoms and to hopefully um, reduce unplanned admissions and exacerbations of diseases. And if we can't do that, we look at lean service delivery, um, so streamlining care, minimizing wasteful activities um, and then finally we look at low carbon alternatives so an example of this would be uh, switching from a pressurized uh, meter dose inhaler which contains harmful greenhouse gases and switching to a dry powder inhaler which has a much uh, lower carbon footprint uh, next slide, please. So for nurses, uh, these principles of sustainable clinical practice really relate to the NMC code and is really a duty for us as nurses. So for example, prevention uh, is part of uh, the code in terms of promoting well-being and Ill, Ill health. We've got patient self-care, so you know, listening to people and responding to their concerns and preferences, uh, lean service delivery, so making sure we reduce as far as possible the likelihood of mistakes, near misses, 
harm and the effect of harm that takes place and take in uh, personal precautions to avoid potential health risks um, to people receiving care in the public. And then the low carbon alternatives um, is really around sort of identifying uh, priorities, managing time, resources effectively. So nurses really have a lot of transferable skills um, to apply to sustainable healthcare. Uh, next slide, please. So the SOSQI framework, essentially, um, if you want to click through, and um, so it aims to improve sustainable value by helping us understand the environmental, social and financial impacts of the current system. We use the principles of sustainable clinical practice, such as prevention and self uh, patient empowerment. And we look at measuring impact on sustainable value. Uh, next slide, please. So I'd like to just take some time to show you um, some case studies where SUSQI has been implemented in practice by nurses um, working across the health system, um, just to kind of show you what can be done. And a lot of these are transferable. Um, so hopefully it will give you some ideas of what can be done. Uh, next slide, please. So we have we run a green team competition and we have lots of uh, trusts that have taken part in this scheme. And it's really an engagement program to help teams undertake SUSQI um, projects. And then um, we run a competition at the trusts and then the winning teams um, receive a financial um, incentive so that they can then uh, develop and further improve uh, the sustainability of their service. Next slide, please. So this is one of the case studies, which was led by a clinical lead nurse. And what the problem was, um, was that a lot of uh, continence products were being wasted and disposed of without even being used. Um, so this contributed to the trust carbon footprint and a lot of the um, continence pro products that they were looking at were pulp products uh, were being left in um, areas where it was unsure whether due to infection control risk, whether they could be used. And when they did an audit, um, they found that around 10,000 items of pulp uh, products were being wasted a year. Um, so they came up with an improvement uh, intervention, which was around an education program for clinical staff and had a poster campaign. And this really worked on uh, behavioral change. And these are the outcomes. So there was no negative impacts on patients um, and they still received the continent uh, continents products that they required but it had a big uh, environmental impact so um, from reducing the waste um, they saved the equivalent of driving uh, nearly 2,000 miles in an average car they had a big uh, financial saving of um, over 2,000 pound a year and it also had some social benefits um, for staff um, because it allowed them to become aware of the environmental impacts in care and also engaged uh, the team in sustainability and they started thinking about whatever areas they could improve. Uh, next slide, please. So this is another uh, case study which was led by nurses at South Warwickshire University uh, Hospital Trust. And it was around um, insulin pens, which are usually single use and disposed of in general waste. So really contributing to the plastic and medication waste within the health system. And there was actually, um, what they wanted to do is uh, switch to smart pens, um, 
which was really beneficial because actually we're facing a shortage of insulin pens globally at the moment due to the increased demand and the increase of diabetes. Um, so these smart pens, um, which are reusable, they last five years, um, but they had a benefit um, in, in terms of uh, that they had a digital memory. Um, so the memory would um, store data on um, the time and the dose of insulin. And so the practical benefits were that it, this enabled uh, patients to take more uh, sort of an active role in their management of uh, uh, administrating their insulin, but it also potentially could uh, reduce the number of district nursing checks required because um, obviously it's stored in the memory. So. The environmental uh, impact of this, uh, they saved uh, over 5,000 miles uh, of carbon, which in an average car, uh, the reusable insulin pens, um, there was an additional, uh, there was an annual saving of nearly 500 pounds, but actually uh, up to 15,000 pounds by eliminating daily district nurse visits um, for one patient. And they also uh, set up a pen cycle initiative where uh, the single use pens were being recycled. So there was a slight postage cost to the trust, but um, obviously the environmental impact uh, was huge. Uh, social impacts. Um, so, you know, the reusable pens provided reassurance, providing uh, that to patients and potentially the reduced uh, need for district nursing appointments. So um, increasing their time. And the recycling brings wider benefits and engages staff and patients in positive actions. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. So this is another one uh, that was done at South Warwickshire University NHS Foundation Trust, and it was around reducing routine blood testing, um, particularly in uh, the elderly population. So the problem that they identified was that many elderly patients were having regular blood tests as inpatients. Um, some of them were having daily blood tests um, and what they found was actually, you know, there was a lot of excessive blood tests, which are obviously invasive, they're painful uh, and can, can be quite distressing to patients. And it exposes patients to unnecessary harm and leads to excessive healthcare waste in terms of the consumables that um, are needed for phlebotomy and in the labs. So um, a decision-making tool uh, was implemented to guide uh, clinicians in terms of uh, if a blood test was actually required, um, because I think there was a, a case of uh, just in case um, sort of behavior culture going on um, and if so if patient did require blood test um, it was the decision making tool helped them uh, figure out what test was essential to guide uh, clinical outcomes and treatment so an intervention <laughs> was uh, put into place and um, an education program was um, implemented with clinical <coughs> staff. And this had, uh, as you can see on this slide, um, obviously the reduced risks of bruising, um, skin damage, um, infection, um, and particularly within the elderly population where skin integrity is uh, poorer, potentially, uh, you know, it, it reduced uh, the distress in those that were vulnerable or had cognitive impairments, and it reduced uh, 
discharge delays because bloods were being ordered and then um you know that perhaps weren't necessary but they were waiting on results um so this improved patient flow the environmental impact so it saved 937 kilos of CO2 equivalent um, and that was from the reduced consumables um, and blood processing. It had a really big financial saving of uh, 18 and a half thousand pounds a year um, and the social impacts with its staff and patients um, were in agreement that excess excessive testing was a problem Staff gained time to focus on other tasks and uh, there was lab staff um, to save uh, nearly 5,000 hours a year in processing time and less testing will likely improve patient satisfaction. Uh, last slide. So this is the last uh, case study, um, or actually second to last. So this is around um, greener personal protective uh, equipment. So this was done at Northampton General Hospital. And the problem that was identified, which I'm sure all of us are uh, acutely aware of, is that there was a substantial uh, increase in PPI items uh, following the COVID pandemic. So it increased from 2.25 billion uh, to 8.7 billion items in 2020. Next slide, please. So the infection prevention and control team uh, put in an intervention to educate uh, staff in terms of the excessive use of PPE. And uh, so this really came into lean pathways of the clinical um, principles. And what they actually found was a lot of uh, staff were wearing uh, gloves and, you know, full PPE, but actually this was uh, potentially increasing the risk of infection because people wearing the same gloves from patient to patient. Um, and actually it was more effective um, to gel hands between OBS um, or wash hands. Um, and also this helped for staff skin integrity because obviously wearing latex gloves, um, or nitrile gloves uh, can really degrade the skin and cause dermatitis. So it had social benefits and health benefits for staff as well. Next slide, please. So they had a, a, a huge reduction in glove use and apron uh, use. And um, they had an increase in staff knowledge around infection control and uh, they saved £23,704, um, which could fund a, you know, a part-time nurse. Um, huge financial, uh, sorry, environmental savings. And they had positive feedback from staff um, and uh, sort of the benefits of uh, changing that culture of um, overuse of PPE. Next slide, please. So this is just the last one. So it's looking at reducing cannulation in ED. Um, if you go to the next slide. Uh, so the team really focused on medical equipment as a hotspot within ED. Next slide, please. And what they thought was the problem is that a large number of patients were being cannulated just in case, and many of the cannuli were not used or were being used inappropriately. So for example, patients that could eat and drink were being given IV paracetamol. Next slide, please. So they did a process map and they looked at the ecological costs, the social costs and the financial costs um, of this process. So they were studying the system. And then next slide, please. So this really focused on lean pathways. So this is sort of an unnecessary uh, for some people um, intervention. 
So they wanted to cut out that wasteful activity. Next slide, please. So what they did is they measured the number of cannula inserted per week and then the number of cannula that weren't used or were used inappropriately. And then they put an intervention in place uh, to engage staff, which they called Think Before You Cannulate. And then they measured uh, the number of cannula uh, inserted and those that weren't used um, after the intervention was put in place. Next slide. So what they found after this is they had a 59% reduction in cannulas being inserted uh, in the first place. And they also had uh, a 66% reduction in cannulas that were being used unnecessarily. Uh, next slide. So uh, this had some really positive patient and population outcomes. It reduced the risk of infection, uh, less inappropriate use of IV uh, fluids. Um, they had an annual saving of nearly £30,000. So again, could uh, provide more uh, staff um, in that saving. Uh, it had a big uh, carbon saving and it increased patients' uh, mobility and independence, obviously reducing pain. And it had a big social value in terms of staff time and improved workflow. Uh, next slide. So is there any questions at this point? Before I go on to... <clears throat> I think if we can come to questions at the end, Siobhan. Yeah, keep yeah. going. There, there okay. are some questions, but Rachel's been answering some of them in the Q&A panel. Oh, brilliant. Okay. That would be great. Uh, Thank you. Next slide then, please. So if uh, you are interested in um, replicating or doing your own study uh, project, improvement uh, project, we have uh, lots of free resources detailing um, how you can go about doing that project. Uh, so we have a step-by-step -step guide and we have lots of resources in terms of how to carbon footprint, how to measure social value. Um, and they're all free downloadable resources um, on our website. We also um, have a e-learning uh, for health module. Uh, which is freely available, um, and that is on SOS2I. Um, so if you want to learn more about this, um, then I would definitely recommend going over to that and completing that. Uh, next slide. So uh, just to let you know that we, we have a Beacon site programme, so the trust and uh, universities that are teaching sustainability and quality improvement are coming on board and being recognized as either aspiring beacon sites. Um, so that means working towards um, embedding this into current quality improvement teaching. And we also have established beacon site status for those um, that have successfully embedded sustainability and their quality improvement education. Um, so if this is something that you're interested in, um, head over to our website and you can apply um, through, through there. Next slide, please. And in addition to that, we also offer the SUSQI Academy. So this really allows you to become an expert in SUSQI and to be able to teach it and embed it into your um, programs and QI teaching within your area of practice. Um, it includes uh, places on our courses. So you, um, our SUSQI course, um, our teaching SOSQI course and also um, carbon footprinting and um, it just helps sort of develop confidence and uh, you would get time to work with the SOSQI experts at CSH um, to embed this into your work uh, and to apply for that um, again it's on our website 
Uh, next slide, please. So at CSH, we have lots of networks. Um, one that I would really like to point out to you is our nursing SUSNet network. And um, every month we have a free Zoom uh, meeting where nurses can come along who are interested or already working in this uh, sustainability speciality. Um, and it's an informal uh, Zoom meeting where you can network and each month we have a different speaker so you can find out about the latest developments within this field. Uh, next slide, please. And like I said, we have lots of courses at CSH um, covering lots of different uh, specialities. Um, so, do head over to our website if you're interested in any of those. And we've got a QR code on there if you want to scan that. And next slide, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Oh, sorry, Mua. Go ahead. Yeah, we've, we've, we've covered a lot of ground. We won't have time to deal with all the questions, but we will respond to the questions. And um, I think we'd like to meet with the Q&I, particularly to discuss this issue. Um, uh, fair enough, the, uh, reducing the number of district nurse visits may seem a good thing, but I remember a district nurse saying to me, well, we tell old people to put their leg up and they also will get better, but we're saying, put your leg up and I'll stop coming to see you. Isolation mm -hmm. is such a huge problem. And we need to think of ways we can substitute. We're looking at digital ways for doing that uh, to reduce the dependence of district uh, nursing. So I think we'd very much like to meet with the QNI and uh, look at the particular issue. For example, e electric bikes. Um, in Oxford, as roads are closed off, electric bikes or electric tricycle may become a much more sustainable and healthier option. So, Rachel, do you think that would be a good? Thing that we could do as a follow-up to this yeah absolutely um uh there is there is a lot going on and and as siobhan said um the network's a great place to share questions and ideas um and ask for help um some of you in the um in the q a have asked about you know scaling best practice again you know we're a small organization there's only 30 of us uh there are loads of people to help so we need lots of people on board and that's the idea of the SUSQI Academy and other other training programs like that is to get more people trained up so that we can we can have more people helping um and the other question I think that was in another question in here that we that I thought we might look at if we've got time which was um from Graham which is basically saying, uh, which might be a good one for you, Muir, these are fantastic initiatives. Concern is that the NHS is incredibly bureaucratic and you know it takes six people and a thousand pounds to change a light bulb. Um, how do we uh, get past that in order to, to make these things happen more quickly, I think is the, is the question. Um, well, I think the, the, the um, uh, I remember once that some of the district nurses saying to me, well, we, 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 know, we, we, we have no time to go to meetings. The other nurses can go to meetings. We are too busy looking after people. So I think we, we might look at a special digital network linked to QNI. And the great thing is for someone just to start something. Um, the chap who made the comment, I'm sure you've got something up your sleeve that's in your mind. Just do it. We'll help you do it. And then we'll have a QNI network of the particular challenges facing uh, the QNI members. Uh, but usually we find keen people out in the field. It's lateral, it's like an infection, it's lateral spread rather than top down is the way to get the revolution going. So Rachel, I think that's uh, real, we know where people live and um, if we could follow up with the QNI, it'd be a privilege and a pleasure. There's the Graham's already volunteered, so. We'll, we'll be in touch. But I think this is the, let's call, call this, this is uh, the launch of the, the Q&I Sustainability Initiative. And that, we, that, we, we always have fun. 
yeah, Muir, that would be fantastic. And and Crystal's already put into the chat panel that she's more than happy to meet to, to look. Oh, to yes, I know. I, I know. I know where Crystal lives. I know where Crystal will be yeah. in touch with <laughs> So... Thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed for, for that very really much. excellent session. There's been a lot of interest in the chat uh, panel, which we will send to you um, separately, um, particularly in the resources and, and in the networks and things. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we're we're potentially on to a, a good thing, Muir, and, and yeah. really, if we can get something sorted out, that yeah. would be excellent. Yeah, yeah. 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 they're great people and uh, we love to work with them. It's a privilege. So thank thank you very much for such yeah. a fantastic session. Bye thank bye. You thank you. Thank you. Okay, then, colleagues, um, we're almost closed um, in terms of today's session. So um, just need to do some thanks for really what has been a fantastic day. It's been an excellent day, really thought provoking. Um, from uh, Rob and Fatima's discussion this morning in terms of tackling health inequalities and through integrated care boards and integrated care systems. I'd like to thank everybody for attending um, and, and to all of our speakers today. Um, it would be really helpful to have your feedback. So if you can complete the survey by clicking on the survey banner in the lobby, um, this will also be emailed to you at the end of the conference. Thank you, a huge thank you to the QNI team who are behind the scenes making everything work and dealing with the inevitable when you've got so many people on a, a quite an unfamiliar platform, an inevitable teething problem. So a thank you to Adina Pito, our uh, events manager at the QNI, and to Aga uh, Kushmesh and the QNI senior program and events coordinator, and the whole QNI team for developing, organising and helping deliver today's event. It's a real team effort and we would not be able to do it without such a dedicated team supporting the conference um, in a variety of different ways, whether it's um, monitoring the chat panel, helping out delegates or whether it's um, providing the communication support and social media support. I look forward to seeing everybody tomorrow at 11 o'clock for day four, our final day of the conference please check the lobby for the agenda and speakers for tomorrow's event, which includes um, a, a range of, of different speakers, but also um, me interviewing Heidi Thomas and Stephen McGann um, from Call the Midwife about the use of um, television programmes to um, address social issues and health inequalities. So that should be an interesting event. Um, and if I could finally ask if you've enjoyed today, please tweet about it using the hashtag, hashtag q 2023 Tell your colleagues that they can also access the recorded sessions and they can register after the event. Um, and you can do that by using the QR code, which I think should be on the screen now. Um, but that ends today's proceedings. Thank you very, very much for attending and for all of your support. <laughs>